Uh, welcome everyone to the introduction to deep learning with Keras. Uh, as I mentioned, we are now recording our workshop. It may be put online later on. If you don't want to be seen, uh, just um, you know, keep your camera and uh, audio off. Um, you can ask in questions in the chat. Uh, my colleague, David Poog is here. You might recognize him from the data science workshop series where he gives a number of different trainings that are complementary to this one as well. I encourage you to look at them. I will also put a link to the YouTube channel where you can go and, and find them. Some that may be immediately of interest would be the one on, on Conda or the one on Python. Now, we will not be using Conda today. We'll be using Google Colab to run our environments. So I will ask that you have a, a Google account and be logged into that account. Um, I'll also point out some features of Zoom that may come in handy, uh, particularly the, the reactions icon at the bottom lets you give a variety of feedback, including uh, you raising your hand if you have a question. Uh, David will try to, to check on that. Also, we may ask certain questions like, has everyone finished the training? Have you got to this point? Have you got your data? And so there's, there's yes and no buttons there. Those are the kind of the check mark and the X. And there's also, you know, if you're falling behind, you can ask for to slow down or speed up. And, uh, and Dave is going to, to, to monitor that as well. So that's, that's a handy little interface. And it'll also help to, you know, to have the chat app so, that, so you can enter in a question if, if you have one. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen and we will get underway. I sent out a link to, to, to a GitHub page that has the training materials there. There's a little bit of explanation about what the training's about. I will review that briefly. And there's also some additional information for you as well, including previous videos on YouTube. Uh, one of the nice things about those uh, video, what YouTube videos is that you can speed them up, watch them at a speed and a half or two times. And, um, and then jump around and, and, you know, at the sections where you need to kind of review or need to pause to kind of understand something you can and then sections where you kind of follow along and understand it and it's, it's working well, then you can kind of speed through. There's um, this section down at, um, in the middle here is basically for the runtime environment. We're going to go with a Google Colab. So uh, uh, Google provides a uh, online resource for running notebooks which is great for data scientists. They also provide uh, GPU resources, which in this case, because we're going to do some image processing is really essential. You um, really speeds things up many, many times. Okay, so what is this training and, and what's it about? Who's it for? It's for a general but technical audience. So if you've already have experience with deep learning frameworks and that have been making your own models and working through your own data, you may be a little advanced for this course, but if you have a technical person with some uh, understanding, a little bit of awareness of how what neural networks are, and and, um, and if you have a little bit of scripting experience with Python, and you want to learn more about uh, deep learning and image processing in general, we're going to cover a substantial amount of ground today. It's not going to be you know mathematically rigorous. We are aiming for practical practicality and for applicability. We're going to cover the Keras and TensorFlow frameworks, both uh, the simple, simpler APIs and some of the more advanced API features. We'll see how to use them to create a variety of architectures. We'll explore a bunch of different networks. And we will also focus on the data processing pipeline as well um, to get a sense of what you might do if, if you had your own data as well. Uh, we'll emphasize understanding through visualization. It's a lot to cover. Uh, we touch on those things and the code examples that are in the notebook will be a good place for you to start. And as you start developing your own models and processing your own data, and um, you'll start from these working examples. What I'd like you to do is we're going to uh, go down to the tutorial section, right click on that, open in Colab. What you should get is this page here. We are in Google's version of the uh, Jupyter Notebook. I'll talk a little bit about that shortly. So the Jupyter Notebook provides a simple cell-based development environment for exploring complex ideas via code, visualizations, and documentation. 
And the notebook has two primary types of cells. There are markdown cells of which you're looking at one of them right now. This is just text and you can mark down as a language, kind of a simple text version of HTML that lets you uh, create titles and lists and things like that, make it kind of look, look nice and, and quote text. And the other type is the a code cell. And so typically this will take a Python code, but also bash scripts. And this is where you have cells that will actually do things. And what will happen is that as we go through the notebook, you'll see a mix of documentation stuff that you can read and uh, code cells, which you will want to run. You'll want to follow through in order with me. There are two or three cells here that are there for you to explore on your own, but will take too long to run if you do it uh, as just if you run all of them at once. Um, the other thing is before we run them, we want to connect to uh, a GPU, which I'm going to show you next. So a little bit about uh, working with Jupyter. So you work with, with cells, the currently active cell appears with a box around it. And the a green box indicates that it's editable. And um, if you click inside a code cell, that makes that cell selected. And that means that you can edit things. And it also means that you'll be able to run it. If you double click inside a markdown cell, you'll be able to see the markdown and edit it as well. You can use tab completion when you work with code. If you're familiar with IPython, which is kind of the command line uh, ancestor to Jupyter, you might recognize how some of this works. It helps you learn the code base and um, saves you from typing a lot of a repetitive code. But it, it usually has to have seen either imported the library or have seen the variable or the code previously. Clicking on the run, uh, which is the little icon next to the, on the little icon next to the cell, if it's a code cell, will execute that cell. That cell runs and whatever output comes from running it will appear um, in the uh, after that cell. Uh, we can do this when we're in the cell with just control enter. Some, some indications on the left hand side, if the if there's a square bracket that's empty, that means that the cell hasn't been run. If there's an asterisk or there's kind of nice in Google Colab, there's nice um, icons that indicate what the status is. But you know, if there's an asterisk or there's kind of a spinning circle, it means that the cell is running. Only one cell can run at a time. If there's a number in the cell and the cell isn't selected, that indicates that the cell was run previously. But it's not always obvious if the cell was run, um, you know, in a previous session or in this current session. What ends up happening is that is that there's something called a kernel, which is basically just in the background running all the code. And as you run the code, it updates the state of the Python environment. So everything that you run updates that state. It's kind of hard to tell what that state is. Typically, you will execute cells in order because the cells are designed to basically rely on whatever has come before to initialize the state, to import modules, and things like that. So that takes us to a little introduction of, of Jupyter. Colab has kind of its own look, but the general idea is, is, is similar. The first thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to set up Colab to use a GPU environment. So uh, by default, it doesn't use an accelerator, it's just CPU. So we're going to go up to where it says runtime, and we're going to go change runtime type, and we're going to set GPU. Click on the runtime uh, menu, go down to change runtime type. It opens up a little uh, dialog, specify the hardware accelerator as GPU, um, and then we will click the save button. And we see uh, uh, up top here that we haven't yet connected. So we haven't yet connected to the back end. Nothing's running, but we have specified a GPU. We can try running our first cell. So we're going to click on this uh, uh, run button here. And the first thing that happened before it runs is going to tell us that this notebook wasn't authored by Google. So I, I did write it, but it's going to ask you, are you sure you want to run it? In part because when you do run in Colab, you can also mount your Google uh, Drive and save files there, or you may have files that are already there, and a malicious notebook might be able to read those or do things uh, because it is able to execute code. Uh, but in this case, you're going to have to run it anyway uh, to run it.
So we click on run anyway, we see that there's a little kind of uh, dancing circle uh, spinning around, and that means that it's running. Nothing appears out of this just because we're just uh, testing, we're just making sure that our um, TensorFlow version is two. We seem to be good to go. And if we look at the at, at up top uh, where we had the connect button before, we see a little checkbox indicating that we are connected to the back end. So if I look here, if I hold my mouse over it, it says what I'm connected to, and it says that I'm connected to a GPU back end with so many gigabytes of memory and disk space and how much RAM I'm using. If you're there, then that's good. Basically, your session has, has begun. Let me just check the chat and see how people are doing. So the keyboard short book, uh, shift enter, just like in Jupyter. Excellent. Okay. What, what does deep learning need? It needs lots of data. That's kind of the fuel for it. So before we can kind of get to the deep learning part, we have to get to the data part. And we're going to use a data set called uh, CIFAR-10, which is a small image data set, 32 by 32 color images of about 10 categories that has a kind of, is already been kind of prepared and pre-processed and is often used for example trainings or, or to test out networks. It's big enough to be interesting, but small enough that we can process it interactively and we don't have to wait too long. So the first thing that we have to do is download it. And as part of that, there's some helper functions that we're going to run that are going to um, either, depending on where this, this repository was, was run from, those files may already exist there, or they may have to be downloaded uh, via the Keras utilities. So we're going to run this cell. It doesn't really do anything except it defines the, the function, these helper functions there. Now we go and we get to the first thing that's going to return some results and do something. We're going to run this cell here, which is the download CIFAR 10 with Keras. And what you should see, it didn't find the local versions of the files because Colab only brings the notebook, not the entire repository, uh, unlike a binder hub, for example, and it's going to download it. It's completed, it's, it's got the whole file and the data is, is now here. So, so now we have the, the data set. We're now ready to start begin to explore that data set. And we're going to set up our environment to load the sort of Pythonic tool sets and libraries and kind of data science and analytics libraries and plotting libraries and of course Keras and TensorFlow that we're going to use to kind of work th through this data. So that's the next thing that we do here. Is, so in the setup, let's click these two cells, which import the, the kind of libraries that we're going to, to, to use. So one of the libraries we're going to use is matplotlib, which is a kind of ubiquitous uh, plotting library for Python, it has good support in Jupyter. It, it normally would write out the images and the plots into a file, but we want to display them inside our notebook. So we're going to, this little magic here, which is um, the percent sign matplotlib inline, we're going to say, you know, show the output from matplotlib in line in the cells output. And so that's going to run that. And now what we're going to do, now that we have this set up, let's just verify that our runtime environment has what we need. If we go down to the end, we can see the output from the cell. We are in Colab. We knew that, but now it knows too. We see what version of TensorFlow we're running, what version of Python we have, uh, if it's built with CUDA support. So CUDA support is synonymous with GPU enabled. And then we see what the GPU is, just a physical device. Okay, so at this point, we've got, got our data. Um, we've, we haven't loaded it yet, but, and, but we've basically set up our environment, made sure that all the libraries that we need are there and that the environment has the right sort of capabilities to do the rest of this notebook. And so now we can begin the next point. Now, before we get to that, here's a little collab wrinkle, a little issue. So collab understands how a notebook is made from different sections. And if we look at the table of contents on the left hand side, you can see how it understands how the entire notebook is broken down into these sections, just the way that, you know, a book is broken down into chapters or, you know, an essay into paragraphs and, and so on and, and sections. So but one little thing that it does is it kind of, it hides 
everything but the first major section. We don't want to go running all these cells. So don't click on, you know, run the cell below. You want this disclosure rectangle and you want to shift click it. Okay. So in doing that, oops, by shift clicking, it now basically reveals all these cells. Okay. They're now no longer hidden, but it's not going to, to run them. We're going to run most of these cells ourselves, ourselves, but it's good if we go through in, in order um, just to understand what each cell is doing. And there's one or two cells, as I mentioned there, that will take a long time and are just there for you to explore on your own later. They typically take a visualization or something that we saw previously with a small part of the data set and show it to you for a larger part or for different layers or things like that. Dealing the data processing is probably one of the largest parts of working in data science and with, with deep learning. Getting the, the data into shape, understanding it, uh, making sure that it's statistically valid, that it's normalized, that it can be processed efficiently. There's a lot of effort that comes into deep learning that happens before the learning ever starts, just to get the data in shape and ready to be learned from. So in our case, we are using a data set that is commonly used everywhere, but there are still things that we can do just to go through it and just get a better understanding of what this data set is about, what its dimensions are, its statistical properties, and we will also kind of have to normalize it from, you know, just images into, into the range of data that the neural networks like, you know, from zero to one, for example. Uh, we're going to go and, and do these processing steps now. So the first thing is, is this, we're going to just make sure that this data is here. Let's click on this cache and then this find. Because it found something, so we've already kind of installed this this version of the CIFAR 10 data set into the data, Keras data sets directory, uh, we are now good to go. We're going to soon load it, but before we do that, I'm going to make some, some helpers. I know a little bit about this data set already. The data sets typically, when, when you do supervised learning, come in two parts. There's the, the X or the kind of the input data, the images, and then there's the Y, which is like the labels. Okay, so you can kind of think of it a bit as um, the data that goes into the function and the expected value that you want out of the function. And this function is what you're trying to figure out, you're gonna train for it. So this data set has kind of the input and the outputs there for you already. And I know that the outputs, in this case, the labeled data, that it corresponds to airplanes, automobiles, bird, cat, deer, and so on, up the truck. In the data set itself, as we'll see, this is just a number. We are going to do some a bit more processing of this data to get it into a format that we can use for, for training. Run this cell just, just to basically create our helper functions. And we're going to start with the, the a, a data load itself. Here we're going to basically use Keras's data sets. Keras belongs as part of is the interface to TensorFlow 2, and so this is what we're going to use. Under data sets, it supports quite a number of them, and one of them is CIFAR 10, and we're going to load it, and that's going to basically take it from that cached directory that we saw previously and load it into memory in the notebook um, and into these four variables. It's, it's going to give us a training set and a test set, and that's going to become important later on because one of the issues with deep learning networks, especially the bigger ones, is that they can memorize all the data and not really learn anything so much. So we keep aside a fraction of this uh, data um, that the network never gets to see while it's training. It never gets to learn from it. And we use that to evaluate how general its learning is. And the reason we do this is because normally we want our networks to be useful to do a, inference on new data, data that's never been seen, that the network hasn't seen before, right? If you had all the data, there's no need to train a network to, to learn, to, to generalize for new data, right? It's because you don't, you ha might have lots of data, but you don't have all the data. So the problem is, is that 
if you try to network on all the data that you have and then it sees some new data, you don't know how well it would do. Imagine if you have a data set where you have a hundred yes, no answers, but 95 of them are yes and, fi and uh, five of them are no. And the network could just learn, just memorize those ones and just default to yes for everything else. And, and but the real world, you know, maybe more than answers are going to should be no and suddenly the network is not going to perform well so we need this this data split to ensure or to kind of verify before we put the network into use that it's going to do a decent job so that's run and so now i i'll have four variables they're basically the x and the y for the train and the x and the y for the test the second one is just a little catch-all just to make sure that the data actually is loaded and now it's in memory. So now what we want to do is we want to explore. We want to figure out like what is in this data, right? We have, you know, what, what is the type? Is it a list? Is it a numpy array? How big is it? What does it look like? And so this next cell is going to print out some information about the data set that I just loaded into memory. And if I run it, I'm going to get some information. What I see, so someone asked, how can you divide the data? In this data set, it's already been done for us. If we simply had a data set and we didn't have it already split, we would want to split it up ourselves. So we could kind of randomly sample. That might be one way, you know, so we could do a, a, a random sample where we choose 80% of them at random, and then the, the remaining 10, 20% are the test cases. Um, or we can use tools, and this one that I'll mention later on, uh, thanks to David, he mentioned it, is sklearn, and um, there's also second um, imbalance to help massage the data into a format uh, that gives us a good representation for the train and the test. So there's tools available to, uh, for us to do that. Lyndon, just a, a quick comment, if I could. Oh, yeah, please, please. So um, this would be a great use case for using the model selection from scikit-learn with stratified sampling, which is what we discussed last week in the introduction to machine learning. So you could use exactly that approach that we used last week. And you would use stratified sampling on the classification, the target column, which Glendon has mentioned. And that would split up a, a, a training sample, a training data set and a testing data set where the distribution of classes was the same between the training and the testing data set. So you, that would avoid the, the situation which can happen with classification problems where you split your training and your testing data set, but one of the classes is very is not well represented. And then you end up with maybe none of those in the training data and all of them show up in the testing data set just as just by for random chance and then your model will perform really poorly so there that approach works really well and i would encourage you to at least start there before thinking about something more more complicated cool awesome uh, uh, thanks david um, actually if you could put a link to that in the um in the chat that'd be great sure sure um, thank you so let's look at what our data set is about we see that the train X and Y are numpy arrays. We see that for train, the data type is U int eight. So that's unsigned int eight. That's basically, that's a byte. So that represents numbers from zero to 255, uh, which kind of makes sense because it's an image format. And then the Y uh, values are also U int eight, which is a small unsigned integer because its values are also in a small range, in this case, zero to nine which we'll see later. And then the other thing that we want to know about them is the shape. So the shape of the X train array is, so the first dimension is 50,000. And that's uh, basically the number of, of training sets that we have. And then we see that after that, we have three dimensions, which is basically X, Y, and the channel. So we have images that are 32 by 32, with three colors. And that's what the, the 32, 32, three mean. The Y data set um, also has 50,000 entries. And so it needs to be the same size as the, as, as the X values. Otherwise, 
you know, you don't you don't have labels for all all your data. And if you're doing supervised learning, you need a label for all the data. Um, but what we see is that the di its dimension is one, which means that there's only one number associated with each one of these entries. And, and we'll see what that number is going to be soon. If we look at the at the the test arrays, we see that they they're very similar, except they differ in the number of examples. So they're only about a fifth of the size of the training set. But each of those examples has the same dimensions. It's a you know, 32 by 32 color image, or it's a, a one byte classifying label. So let's, let's run this next cell and get some statistical information about it. What we see is that for the, the training set, uh, we see that its min max values go from zero to 255 with the, the, the mean of them around 120. That's kind of to be expected for a color image because that's because each one of these channels is represented by uh, a byte or an unsigned eight. And so its range of values is zero to 255. Zero will be kind of black intensity uh, or, or you know, lowest intensity. 255 will be highest intensity. So you know, in the red channel, zero would be a black, but 255 would be a very bright red. Same for green and blue. For the Y, array, we see that its min max is 0 and 9, and, and all values in between. Well, I'm jumping ahead of myself. We haven't seen that for sure yet. But this makes sense because there's 10 categories. So they're numbered 0 to, to 9. So let's try to understand a little bit more about these data sets. The numbers tell us a little bit, but what do they look like? You know, so we know like the min and the max, but what are the other statistical properties? So let's do some histograms for that. Let's run the next cell here, which is just a helper function to, to just to plot out images. If I run the cell afterwards, it's going to grab a random set of the images there, and it's going to show them with their labels. You know, if you, if you run, run that again, you'll get a different set. Cool. So what we see is we, we see the, the labels at the top and we see the example images. And so that's the challenge that our network is going to have to satisfy. It's going to have to be, it'll be given these images and it'll have to figure out what the proper label for it is. So that gives us a sense of what we're dealing with. Let's go and look at some of the histograms for this data to get a better sense of its statistical properties. So let's run this, this helper cell right here. And then I'm gonna do a histogram plot of the training data. And then I'm going to run the cell after to do a histogram plot for the test data. Now, let me just go and look at this first plot. On the left-hand side, we have the histograms for the Y values. So just as before, we see that we have, you know, values 0 to 9. Okay, so there's the min and the max. But more importantly, we see that the breakdown is that all the categories have an equal number of examples for them, which is important. So the network is going to basically see, you know, an equal number of all the of all the different types of, of categories. Remember that original data set was fifty thousand in size, and we see we have ten uh, categories, and so each one of them has five thousand examples. If we look at the histogram for the image data, that's for the the, the X um, image arrays uh, that are the input, we see that. It has you know, kind of a normalish type distribution. We can see that bright colors, bright intensities. There's a you know a noticeable peak there. You know probably like for pure whites and so on. And there's a little bit of a peak down on the other end for the pure blacks. And if we scroll back to our image here, we can kind of see how that happens. Like look at this automobile, just an automobile on the white background. So lots of whites, high intensity. Airplane in the cloud, lots of high intensity colors, dog with a black background, frog with a black background. So these backgrounds tend to be bright or dark. And that, that will account for these peaks that we see here. But basically, you know, it seems reasonable distribution of values. Um, let's compare this to the test arrays. Again, for the Y cases, we see that the test set also has an equal number of examples for all the categories. Not as many, of course, because there's not as many test examples. But so there was 10,000 total test examples. 
and each category now has a thousand. So the test is representative for each category. Let's look at the distribution of the, the values for the test input X values. And we see that it looks fairly similar to the, the training set. So that distribution, so it looks basically like we have picked our test examples are kind of representative of the examples that we've also been, been training on. And we can also do, let, let's go and just have a, a look for curiosity's sake into the per class histograms and just compare their distributions. And if we find that, you know, so we'll, we'll, we'll see if, um, if anything stands out as being potentially problematic. I will point out that if we didn't have a nicely balanced test set, training and test, um, that we could rebalance them. And there's tools like Imbalanced Learn, for example, and other tools that David had mentioned that allow you to, to, to do this. Here is an example per label comparing the training and the test distributions for each category. And I think, so it's kind of interesting that they're not exactly like the histogram for the global histogram. Some of them are more flattened than others. Some have bigger peaks. They look a little bit like the original, but they all are similar to each other. Okay. Which, so that's kind of the essential part and they don't look unreasonable. So for example, if you were to see that, you know, maybe all the, 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 category zero all had very dark values and all of category two had kind of medium values and category three tended to have, you know, bright values. The neural network might not really learn what's in the picture, but just the brightness and use that to, to figure out what the category was. There's um, an amusing tale from many years ago when they were trying to use neural nets to process uh, images to find, you know, camouflage tanks. So they had a bunch of images of their tanks, camouflage and uncamouflage tanks. And the, um, and the network was trained and did quite, quite well. But then when they tried it with some other data, it didn't work well at all. And it turned out that what had happened is that all the images with the camouflage tanks had been taken, you know, in the morning and all the images without the tanks had been taken in the afternoon. And so there was a difference in the angle of the sun. And that's what the neural network was picking up on, not the fact that there was a camouflage tank there or not. You know, you have to kind of make sure that these uh, distributions are, are reasonable. And these ones certainly seem to be, they're not abnormal. And if they, they are, then you can try, you might want to add another step to your pipeline to pre-process these images in certain ways to help normalize them, ensure that certain characteristics of that data set are statistically similar. Ah, okay. So someone asked, is the, the difference in scale a problem? Good catch. That's a great observation. So I know that you can read my screen if you've noticed that. Um, no. And the reason being is because we're doing a histogram. These aren't normalized for their heights. And so because the training data set has like five times as much data in it, uh, we would expect their, their absolute heights to be five times greater, but it's the essential shapes of them that are important. Yes, what I, I might do is, is is just get rid of the um, the values on the on, on the on the y direction because because they're histograms that that is number isn't valid for comparison. So basically, we've done kind of a simple statistical analysis. We've we know a little bit about our data set now. We know, you know, how big the data is, how many samples there are, some of the statistical properties. Let's try to explore it using some more sophisticated tools. And so we're going to use two, uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis, and, and TISNI, which is um, a, a way to basically take high dimensional representations and preserve some of the interesting properties there about their interesting relationships and preserve them even as it shows it in lower dimensions. So in principle component analysis basically is going to find the dimensions in the image space uh, or whatever vector space you're in that has the most variance. And so kind of has most of the information for the images. I would just, may just point out here about how to understand images 
as, as, as vectors. Let's say that I have a 20 by 20 image of my face, okay? That's 400 pixels altogether. So I can think of it, you know, kind of as an array of 20 by 20 and, you know, but I can also think that each one of these pixels is actually a dimension in an image space and the intensity of it, whether it's dark or light or, or medium gray, those intensities are kind of the, the length of the vector in that dimension. And so instead of thinking of, you know, an image as a bunch of pixels, you can think of it as a vector in a very high dimensional space. And so, you know, if, if you take the, you know, this 20 by 20 image, um, it's going to become a, a 400 dimension vector in a particular space in this, you know, let's say it's for a face database. The representation of my face is just a point in that space. And now you can start asking, well, where are the other faces? What, what points do they occupy? Are there certain regions of this face space where there are no faces, right? And which one of these dimensions or, or which set of these dimensions is most relevant or interesting for, for representing faces? And so what you can think of is that you can create a new new basis vectors that lets you describe faces more compactly. So in the case of a face, there, there might be some combination of these vectors, a point there that represents, so there's a point in the space that might represent kind of a, a blob, a, a, an elliptical blob in the middle of the image, right? And that might be kind of the most common feature of, of faces is that there's this ellipse there. And then the next one might be that there's some, you know, the eyes and the mouth, just a little bit darker than everything else, right? And so that might be the, the second vector in this new basis representation. And suddenly, you know, all this noise that might be, you know, variations for you know, the shine on the forehead or, you know, the, the lighting or the shadow or whatever, those details kind of aren't as important as these main features. And so what, what these um, techniques are going to do is basically see if we can go from our image space directly to something interesting that we can kind of separate out the interesting categories in our data set immediately. So that's what we're going to do with the principal component analysis. So we're going to use uh, uh, scikit-learn for this. Let's click on this cell here. What it's going to do is import scikit-learn and basically do a PCA decomposition. Um, it's going to get just, it's going to save just 40 components out of, out of the image. The, the image has maybe like a thousand or 3000 com components. Uh, we don't want all of those. We just want the, the, ma the main ones, the ones that account for the biggest difference uh, between images. So we've run it and we've got our PCA features and our categories. Uh, and now we just want to plot it to get a sense of, of what's there. Let's click this next cell so that we get the plot utility function. And let's go and, and show that. Okay, each one of these images corresponds to a vector in this image space, right? Because you can go back and forth between this, the vector and a high dimensional space and, and, and an image array, right? And the order in which they appear is the order in which um, they basically make the biggest contribution to building up these other images. And you can think of, so you can take any image in this CIFAR 10 data set, and you could build it by kind of adding together portions of these components. So to begin with, you will see that a lot of the images have an object in the center. Almost all of them, there's some object in the center. And if we look at the first three components, there's some sort of blob in the center. And the first three you see is that, you remember we had like the, the airplane with the, with the cloud background. So there's kind of dark with light. We had another where there was, you know, a frog with a black background. And so there's kind of light and dark. And we also had those where, you know, you kind of have land in the foreground and, and sky in the background or some, or some variation of that. So you kind of get this vertical split. And voila, in the first three uh, principal components of this image data set, we see that these are kind of the, the main features. 
And as we get to, 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 to basically you see that the components as you go down in how much they contribute to the overall appearance, that the frequencies on them become higher, there's a little more details and, you know, and they would get kind of noisier and, and so on as, as you go on. And you, you can see some of them are, are going to help you bring in colors. Some will help you lighten or darken certain areas. It's a little weird, but if you want, you could rebuild any one of the other images, just taking a linear weighting of these ones here. So that's basically how the principal component has broken things down. And what we can try to do is plot these to see if we can just using like two dimensions, if we can find in there a way to discriminate the different categories. So we're going to create our helper functions for the 2D and the 3D plot. And now comes, we can kind of see that certain categories, some of them tend to have a little less of component one, a little more of component two, like the reds, and the purples tend to be up to the top left. And the, uh, so what that corresponds to like three and four, whatever category that was. We see that, you know, lower right, we started to see more like the category zero and category nine, you know, there. But we don't get a clean separation. What we would like is if we were able to, if there, if, in this space, in the image space, we could distinguish between the different categories. We would see a nice separation here already, and we don't. And that's kind of the first indication or an early indication that we really do need to apply deep learning because we're going to have to learn to distinguish a lot of features which look similar in image space, but are really quite different in the semantic space, right? Birds and planes have wings, but they're different, right? Let's just have, have a look at the 3D version of this. Matplotlib, if you specify a matplotlib widget, you would get a version that you could rotate as well. And somehow when rotating in 3D, you could get a bit more information. But in this case, again, the data set is quite complex and you don't really get a nice separation at the image space. But it's going to show that that's possible. Later on, when you look at the MNIST data, you might see an interesting difference because it's a different, simpler data set. Let's talk about another a dimensionality reduction technique that produces even better results most of the time than principal component analysis. What, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through, I'm going to explain it later while it runs because it's slower. That's the other thing. So let's go and run this first cell, which is basically going to create the scikit-learn pipelines. We're going to take the PCA decompositions and use them to decrease the dimensional space for TISNY because TISNY is very slow. So we want to make the problem a little simpler for it. We're going to uh, basically construct the, the TISNY features in the category, and then we're going to run it. There are different versions of this. There are uh, GPU enabled versions and there are variations on TISNY that are more performant. So I'll explain what it is that it's doing here. Working with high dimensional spaces can be very difficult, be hard to imagine. And, and one of the issues there is that the, the neighborhood of, of the points that you have. You might have points that are further away in the original space but are really more related to each other. So they, they, they kind of share neighbors. So there is a, there's the concept of, of a manifold that when you have a high dimensional space, you know, such as, as image spaces are, that your actual data um, occupies a manifold of this. Now, let's say that you have a sheet of paper and you put a bunch of dots on there of, of different colors. And those two colors represent the two categories that you have. You might be able to draw a line that cleanly separates them, okay? So that would be like a conceptual space, right? This is a really a nice a feature space where the two essential features of these two classes nicely separate out. Now try crumpling that paper up into a ball. And this becomes your new space. This will be the kind of the original, the image space. 
The problem now is, is that when you've crumpled this ball up, you may have, you know, let's say a, a blue and a red dot close to each other just because they got folded together. But if you were to follow the paper around, you would see that it takes longer to get from the blue to this red, even though in the current space you're in, it is nearby, then it would be to get from the blue to the other blues because the blues are occupy a neighborhood on this manifold. And so uh, one way to think about deep learning is that you are taking this crumpled ball of paper and trying to uncrumple it so that you go from this very complex space where the things you're interested in are distributed in, in ways that's kind of hard to access with the, the representation that you have. And you're trying to un unwrap it, unwrinkle it, and flatten it out. <clears throat> so now you have a new space, a feature space, that lets you easily separate one category from another. Uh, what Tisney is going to do is it's going to it's going to try to preserve the locality. So if you imagine that you had this crumpled up paper in a very high dimensional space, and you wanted kind of a flat version of it, <clears throat> what Tisney would do is it wouldn't put two points that are close together in the space close together in your smaller space. It would put points that are nearby neighbors of each other. It would put them close together. And then what it would kind of measure is how many neighbors of neighbors of neighbors do I have to get through to make to get to this other dot, this other point. And so even though the points are close by in space, the traversal through its you know, closest neighbors ends up being very long. And, and so points that have that characteristic, it tries to spread apart, apart further in the low dimensional space. In points that are clumped together, you know, there's fewer neighbors of neighbors tend to be clumped together in the low dimensional space. So it, it basically gives you a sense of the neighborhood groupings that exist in that higher dimensional space. A few things about Tisney is that it's really purely for visualization. Every time you run it, uh, because of its optimization algorithm, you're going to get different results. So you can't use it to get reproducible simplifications of your original data set. Um, there are other algorithms, similar algorithms, that would be suitable but are deterministic. Uh, but Tisney is purely for visualization. So let's go to see what it looks like. So this is the result of Tisney, basically laying out this complex high dimensional image space into just two dimensions, trying to preserve the neighborhood groupings that exist in that high dimensional space. You can see it does a little better job of separating stuff out, out not completely perfect, but you can see that purple seems fairly, which is um, number four, seems fairly distinct from uh, teal, which is number nine, the blues, which is zero, seem to be clumping together kind of close to each other, although in two separate clumps. So um, again, this kind of tells you that whatever the manifold is between this image space and the category space, that the kind of semantic space of the images is fairly complex. But fortunately, deep learning is well equipped to solve that problem. So please don't run the next cell because it's going to take a long, long, long time, but it's for the 3D version of this. Because you have this extra dimension, you can kind of separate some of the clusters out a bit more, but it still doesn't give you the nice separation into categories. Um, wait until you see the, um, the exercise with MNIST for kind of nice, surprising results. Okay, let's start with the data conversion. So we've seen our data set. Uh, we know a fair bit about it now. We know that it's, uh, data, it's uh, value ranges because it's an image set are from zero to 255. Uh, we also know the labels are as numbers, but this, this isn't the right format for deep learning processing. So there's two issues here. One is that the input for, uh, for uh, deep learning networks, uh, we like to keep values in the range zero to one. That's, uh, that's typically where the, those networks work best because of the, the non-linearities, the functions that we use for non-linearities have kind of best results in that range. The other issue is with the labels themselves. 
So the issue is that we have to go from this encoding where we are using a number for the category into something that's called a one hot category. We're, we're going to have to go into a different category space. One of the reasons, one of the motivations for this is that we want to be able to uh, make this a continuous space, right? Imagine if I have category one is a horse and category two is a car. So what is category 2.5, right? If I want to be somewhere between them, you know, if I want to make the space continuous instead of discrete, you know, is that a horse car? Like, what is that? Is that, is that my uncertainty? Is, it, just, it doesn't really make sense. But if I basically give every category its own dimension, so I could then, I could then represent something that's, you know, half horse and half car, right? Or, or it could represent my uncertainty that I, you know, 50%, 50 it could be a, a horse, 50% it could be a car, I don't quite know, right? This higher dimensional space, which in our case will be 10 dimensions, we're going to uh, change our discrete category numbers into this space. And because the, the starting values are discrete, you know, so if, if horse was, let's say one, then we know it's a horse, right? There's no uncertainty there. So we would then make, you know, the horse dimension one and all the other dimensions zero. So this, you know, one of them is one and the rest are zero. It's called one hot encoding because only one of them. <clears throat> but it's interesting that this representation still satisfies the probabilistic properties that of certainty because we're basically said that we're 100% certain it's the horse could, because all the, the numbers in the one hot encoding do add up to one. So it is a probabilistic representation. So we're going to just massage our data into the right formats for our network. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to convert into the one hot encoding using a Keras utility called two categorical, okay? And that's, and that's for, for, so two categorical for 10 classes. And then what we're gonna to do to the, um, to the X for both the training and the test is we're gonna convert it from a integer, remember it was unsigned int, into a float. So a floating point representation. And then we're going to scale it, a divide, you know, we're gonna basically scale it by 255 so that it's now in the range zero to one. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of pack this into new variables for the train data and the test data, which are gonna have basically be tuples that contain this, these uh, new kind of normalized values and categorical values. So when I run this, this does the work and this next cell is gonna print out the information about them. And what we can see is that you know, for the for the X train, we are still dealing with numpy arrays, uh, but now there are floats instead of ints. That actually increased their size, by the way. So um, uint is one byte, a uh, float of four bytes, or float 32 is four bytes. So four times bigger, uh, but that's okay. We've got lots of memory. And so, and the shape of them stays the same because we keep the same number of examples and the dimensions of the images didn't change either and similar for, for the testing as well. For the Y, we see that it is, as before, a numpy array. Um, it now, too, has a float representation, not an integer representation, because we want to kind of measure this uncertainty between zero and one. And if we look at the shape, we see that the number of examples remains the same, but instead of having just one value, per example, there's now 10. And that corresponds to a 10-dimensional representation for the categorical space. Now we're getting ready to, to create our own network, to, to make our own model. And to do that, we're going to reuse a model that was already trained uh, and knows it, it saw a much larger image data set than we're going to work with today. So it's kind of the um, image uh, example expert, right? It's, it's been trained, it knows lots of stuff. And so we're going to start from what, what it knows, but it, it didn't, it wasn't trained on CIFAR 10 and it just knows about lots and lots of images. It was trained in a different data set on, on ImageNet, uh, which had bigger images and more categories, but it's seen lots of images. And so 
we're going to use it as the starting place to kind of learn about you know, the basics of the image. And then we're going to add our own uh, categorizer on top of this network. So that to do that, the first thing we're going to need to do is download these models. We're now ready to get to the deep learning part of the process, building off of networks that have already been trained and um, kind of tweaking them. Let's go and get these pre-trained models. Let's click on this cache model cell. This one here is where it's going to load. We're going to use one called VGG16, and it was trained on ImageNet. And we're not going to include the top because we're not interested in its classifier uh, because our categories are different. And we're going to tell it about our input shape as well so that we can kind of pass in our images directly to it. And we're also going to say that it's not trainable because it already has been trained. And if when we do our training, which is just for our classifier, we don't want the weights in this network to be modified because basically it has learned and it would end up unlearning by unlearning on a smaller data set. And then we're going to plot out the model, a graphical view of it to see what it looks like. So the model is being downloaded and the 3D view is, is here. As I scroll through it, I see that it's a, a linear tree, kind of a list. And I see, so it, but similar to you know, trees in computer science, they're drawn upside down. So we actually start at the top and, and work our way down. So we see the input layer. And then after this, we get conv2d, con that stands for convolutional layers, conv2d, the max pooling, convolutional, convolutional pooling layer, convolutional pooling, and, and so on. So what we see is a network made from three types of layers. And each of those layers contains uh, neurons and those neurons are represented by weights and how they're connected to each other determines what the model as a whole is able to learn. We will talk a little bit more about convolutional uh, convolution shortly when we will inspect them visually. But basically a convolution is a way to look at just a, a local, very localized information and make an assessment based on that. So we'll, we'll probably see later, a lot of these convolutionals use kernels that are only three by three pixels or, or neurons, whatever. And they will be looking for, for things like edges or you know, curves or things like that. They will be kind of slid all across the the, the image. So you can think of one of these convolutional kernels as a feature. It's a, it's a very small feature detector that only looks at the neighborhood. Now, traditionally, layers were fully connected. So all of the neurons were connected to all of the other neurons previously. And if you wanted to do an image analysis uh, network, you, know, you, you basically need neurons to represent kind of every part of, of the screen. Of, of, of the image. But the problem is, is that if one of those neurons learned about an edge, its neighboring neuron would have to re relearn that too. But with convolutions, the, because the convolution gets to see the entire image, whatever feature that it's going to learn, let's say an edge, it gets to see edges all across the image. So it, it actually gets to see a lot more data and there's less neurons to be trained. So training is faster, it sees more data, and it learns more general concepts that are applicable everywhere. What happens though, is that after the, you, know, you apply a kernel to the image, the image size mostly stays the same. Now, depending on how you handle the edge cases, the image might become like one pixel smaller every time. We would kind of like, if these are image detectors, we would, what we'd like to be able to do is come down to just a few features that are basically say like, yes, no, there was a cat, there was a dog. Like, so, so eventually we'll get to the point where there's a feature detector for a cat or a dog, right? We're just interested, is the cat, is there a cat in the image anywhere, right? And so we, we kind of, we want to shrink this, the image down, and this is what the, the pooling layers do. Mm -hmm. And so if you can think of a, a feature detector, by pulling it together, you take a small neighborhood of whatever these feature detectors have found, and you're kind of asking, have any of you found an edge? 
right? And if one of them has, then it reports there's an edge. And now you can kind of shrink the space down. Um, typically, this might be done on a four by four subset of the image and just turn it into one pixel, right? And you're taking the max because you just want evidence for something. You know, it just has to be somewhere in there. Is there an edge somewhere in this area? Is there a cat somewhere in this area? So you're losing locality of where the cat is, but you're gaining just the knowledge that there was something there and you have less, there's less data to, to deal with. So that's what the max pooling is, is doing. Uh, we can also get this uh, summary view of it. So the summary view has similar information to this graphical layer by layer view of the network, but it has a little bit more information in there. And as you see, there's basically kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the layers that we saw previously and the layers that we're seeing now. But we also are seeing things like their output shape and how many parameters they use. And so this gives us an idea of how big the memory requirements are for the model and also how much training will be required or how long training will, will take. Because the more uh, parameters, which is the weights inside these layers, the longer training will take. One of the reasons that we're introducing layers here is that uh, layers are kind of the fundamental building block in Keras. So inside the layers, you have a lot of the neurons and you have you know, the weights and the activation functions and things like that. But the nice thing about Keras is that you kind of build your networks almost like kind of plugging Legos together where you know, each of the layers is kind of like a, like a Lego brick that you kind of plug together. And by plugging them together and running the the data through forward through the um, the network you go from input to output with with Legos they, they all kind of have the same plug-in interface but in this case uh, we have to make sure that the outputs of one shape become the inputs of the other so they have to fit together all the way through so this gives us a sense of both what this network how this network was made and some information about it and how the layers uh, how big they are and what they're composed from. And one of the things that you can see, for example, is what we see in the first convolutional layer is that the convolutions are going to cover this 32 by 32 area. But, um, and I believe that they're, they're three by three, although th th this doesn't show it here. Um, there's 64 of them, which means that at this very early image processing layer, we will be able to learn about 64 possible different features. And uh, we'll see in a bit what those might, might be. And, and as we go up, we're able to kind of represent more and more features, but the, the kind of the, the image that we're working on, which goes from like the original image space of dogs and cats and planes to this kind of up to a feature space, but the feature space image becomes smaller and smaller, but the number of kind of categories of features that we could learn about increases as we go up. Cool. Let's go and learn a little bit about what these layers are made up from. We'll run these next two cells. So conf base was this fraction of a network. It's, it's a network, you know, and it has a lot of layers in it. And what you can do is it's built layer after layer after layer. And with Keras, you can basically take this network and look at the layers. The uh, first layer is zero which is the input. And we can also ask what its input shape is. And as we see, this matches the data that we're going to apply to it. So remember the, 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 um, the data set that we had? Well, it has the same shape as well. Yeah, so, so basically if we, if we look at the shape for our training and the, and the shape for the input for the, for the network, it does match. Okay, and that, that's essential. So now we're at one of these cells where we're going to explore what these layers are about. So don't run them all. There's some very expensive ones that we won't run. So a shift and click on the expand to, to get all the children. We're going to need some helper functions. So I'm just going to click on this first one. This is just to uh, plot some images and the, the model layers. We're going to visualize the weights that are in these convolutions. We're going to visualize what they output. And we're also going to see what excites these convolutional kernels the most. So we're going to basically create some images that these uh, feature kernels respond to uh, uh, strongly. 
And then we're also going to uh, visualize the layer response. So let's go and run this first visualizer. What we see is that the kernels are three by three. So they, ha they have nine elements each. Layers one and two have 64 kernels. Three and four have 128, as we mentioned before. A light pixels are high valued and indicate a preference for an activated pixel. Uh, dark pixels indicate preference for an inactive pixel or no preference. And the kernels, many of them seem to represent at this, these low layers seem to represent things like, like edges. So for example, this one right here looks like it, it likes the transition between dark to light. It, it likes a, a vertical transition, a vertical edge. Uh, this one over here seems to like a corner uh, where you get some dark object here and, and, um, and there's, or, or some sort of angle thing. Um, you know, you might use these together and build them up in later levels to maybe to look for things that are circular, like eyes, um, and you can put a few of them together. There's things which, like this one here, might like edges that are at an angle, like a 45 degree angle. And so you can kind of see variations of, of, of edge detection and, and spot detection and things like that. Um, so someone asked, can we increase or decrease the number of layers? Yes, absolutely. But that will come later when we build our own, uh, our own network from scratch. So this, pre this network that we're loading has already been trained. It already has a particular architecture. It already has the configuration and, and weights. So we won't be adding new layers into it, but we can add layers on top. Like we can kind of join them together or we can create our own uh, model from scratch, in which case we can create as many as we want. Our, our model will be quite simple. We'll have, because the data set's simple, it will only have a, a few layers and still be quite effective. And if you want to learn, you know, if you have more complex data sets or want to learn some of the, the different architectural uh, techniques for composing these layers together, you can look at some of the other architectures and models that, that are out there that have demonstrated proficiency with you know, the large image data sets. Let's run this next cell here. We're gonna pick a, a random image and we're going to try to apply these feature kernels, these convolutional kernels to the image and see what, what the feature image ends up looking like. When we start with the, with the lower layers, we see that each one of these feature kernels basically gets applied to the image. And what it does is it produces a number for each location that indicates how much of that feature was there, like how much there was an edge or, or, or not. So, so, so what you see is that, is that when this is applied to this image of a truck, that the different kernels are going to create kind of different feature images. Some of them may indicate that there is a, a leading edge from light to dark, which is what this one seems to register. Um, so it, it likes that edge that went from light to dark down there. It also seemed to like it when we got to the bumper. And you can look through to get a sense of what sort of features that kernel is trying to, to pull out of the image. Now, as you go up the layer, so this next layer here is going to be, a, the kernels will apply to the previous layer, not to that original truck image. And bit by bit, as we go through, this, we will see the resolution decreases because the actual, the image is, is getting smaller and smaller. And at some point it becomes kind of hard to, you, you know, you, you don't see a, uh, a truck anymore. And th this is, although we show it as an image, it's really kind of a, a feature representation where some certain type of feature is there. So you can kind of think of it as maybe like in a face detection where, you know, at low levels, you might detect you know, um, edges, and then with a, and, and you put a bunch of edges together to kind of find, you know, where there's eyes, nose, and then so at some mid layer, there might be features that say there's a nose here, there's an eye here, and then some higher level level for a face that says, you know, yes, I do see a face here, but it, it, below it, it needs these other feature images, and it kind of gets information from multiple of them. Um, collecting that there's an eye here, a nose there, a mouth below, that sort of thing. It becomes harder and harder to interpret these as you get higher and higher into the uh, up the network.
So let's see what makes these kernels the happiest. And so what we're going to do is we're kind of going to train backwards in a way. So we're going to kind of start off with, a, a, with some random noise on the input. And we're going to, so for each one of these kernels, we're going to ask, you know, how would I, how would I change this image so that you would respond uh, with a higher value? It would make you, you know, more excited. Kind of an image-based view of what these, what features these kernels are looking for. And as you see early on, we are looking for basic edges and lines. You kind of see like the small angles. This indicate that it's it's looking for for angles at certain edges. There are a few of them that don't really seem to be looking for anything except maybe a color. So as as we go up, we start to get more more complex textures. Now this next one, don't run it because it takes even longer. It looks at even higher layers or later layers in the network, and there you start to get complex textures and patterns, things that you know, might look for eyes or or things like that. This technique, this visualization technique that we're using here, which is the, the, the layer response, gives us a per feature source image that basically lets us see uh, what type of image uh, would activate this kernel the most. Another possibility that we could do is we could go through our image data set and find out which one of the images uh, activated that kernel, that feature detector the most and then try to localize it. But this is this is a way here. And now you see, we're starting to see more complex uh, patterns, again, oriented textures and things like that. And from this, it's going to build up these higher level of feature detectors. Okay, let's go and build our first model. We're going to use the very simple sequential API for Keras, which is good for when you have a sequential or linear one layer after the other. And um, you can basically just kind of put them together in a list even, uh, which is kind of what we're, we're doing. This model add that you see below, it's kind of like the way that Python lists, you can kind of add new elements to them. We're going to import some particular new layers from Keras that we're going to use. And I'll just explain a little bit of what those are. Uh, first of all, of course, we want the sequential. We're going to get to get the sequential, the simple API. And that, that's going to be the, the, the model that we're, that, that we're going to build. And the model is just the container for, for the layers. The layers we're interested in are uh, flatten, which lets us take um, convolutional layers and basically turn them into kind of like one array. There's also a dense layer, which is a flat uh, layer, a flat kind of a array of, of neurons, of values, but it's fully connected. This sort of layer is useful for when we do categorization because it's going to create this feature space this, at this dense layer, and it has access to all the information below it. And so it's, it's going to be densely connected. Every layer also needs an activation. Sometimes this gets specified as part of the definition of the layer. Um, here, we're going to add it as a separate thing, as a separate layer. The activation function is the nonlinearity that we're going to introduce. And here, we're going to use uh, ReLU, which is rectified linear unit. So basically, neural networks are, they're universal function learners. Most of the operations in them are just linear operations. So when you get, when you, when you multiply the weights of the neurons by the, the values that come into them, that's a linear operation. And so if you were to combine together only linear operations, you could only create linear functions, not universal functions. And so these um, nonlinear activations, which are done after the output for a layer, they give the nonlinearity that lets the network learn arbitrary things. And so in that previously in that paper unwrapping example I gave, that nonlinearity of the activation is what lets you kind of unwrap it, that, that, that manifold in that high dimensional space. There are a bunch of different activation functions. They have different characteristics. The, uh, the ReLU one has a lot of nice properties and fewer pitfalls. Uh, one of the issues with 
tan H and the sigmoid function, which are, is that they tend to flatten off once they get the values become too large. So what can happen then is that unless you continually normalize uh, the values of the weights in a layer to keep them within a reasonable range, the learning that happens at that layer will slow down to the point where you can't learn anything new. And that limits what the, the network can learn. But ReLU gives you that nonlinearity. It's linear in positive values and zero in negative values. And so no matter how your weight values grow, you know, the step that you make will still have a, a corresponding effect on the values of, of the weights. So what we're going to do is we're going to create, we define a function to help build our model for us. And then we call that function to get the model instance. And one reason for this is that if we need to, we can create a new model by just calling the function again. In this case here, if we pass in a base network, we are going to use it. But if not, we're basically going to do the work that we did before, which is to create this non-trainable uh, base network. Then what we're going to do is to create our new model is we're going to say we're going to create a sequential model. We're going to add our convolutional base to it. That was that previous network that we explored. Then we're going to flatten the output that comes off the top of that network. So that, so that was, it was a max pooling. And I think its shape was, what was the, what was the shape for that one? Oh, yes. Yeah. So I think this is the last one here. So it's one by one by five, 12. So we're just going to flatten it into from three dimensions into, into one. That's what that flatten is for. And then we're going to add a dense layer on top of that. By the way, flatten doesn't need an activation because it's not, it's not learning anything. It's not really changing. It's just of changing the shape of the values so that the layers can fit together. And then we're gonna create a dense layer with 512 neurons in it. That'll be fully connected to that previously flattened layer. And we're going to use a ReLU as, as an activation for it. And then we're gonna add a dropout afterwards. And while the network is training, I'll explain a little bit of what the, the dropout is doing, but it's there to help improve the performance of the network on the test case. And then what we do is we go to our final layer in the network, which is a dense layer as well, but it only has 10 classes. So this is the number of classes. <clears throat> That's the categorization layer right there. And the activation for it is going to be a softmax, which is going to enable us to basically do a, a cross entropy when we go and create compile it, we will use a loss of categorical cross entropy because there are 10 categories and we want to kind of treat them as probabilities. So with that, let's run that cell. And what we're going to do is we're going to create it and print out a summary for it. So we can see that all the layers that show up here are the ones that we actually added into that sequential model. Uh, we see our VGZ 16 as the, as the, uh, convolutional base, we see that it has a 14 million parameters, but we don't have to train those, but we do have to compute with them. We then see the layers that we've added here. And we see that uh, at, in the summary at the end, we can see that there's about almost 15 million parameters, but only uh, about 270,000 of them are going to need to be trained. So someone asks, about why do we have two dense layers at the end? So one of them is for, uh, the last one is, is for the uh, classification, obviously of, of the category. So that's why it, it has, you know, uh, num classes. But what is the, what, what's the purpose of the one previous to it? So that's a good question. And the reason being is that depth is, so in a neural network, whenever you have a layer, there is an opportunity for another non-linearity and an ability to kind of unwrap a part of that, that manifold that we talked about earlier. If we, so, and remember, we, we kind of explored the image space and we saw how the image space really wasn't a very good representation for <clears throat> getting the categories out. Because even as we tried to kind of access the categories directly from that representation, it was impossible, right? So 
if the final layer of the, the base network, which is basically doing these convolutional filters and extracting features, if the, if the feature space that we ended up in didn't have a nice mapping to the categories that we're interested in, that extra dense layer is an opportunity to learn something else about the combination of these different uh, features and extract basically some of the unfolding operation to make it easy for that last layer to extract the categories. Um, so, uh, uh, David, you had something you wanted to add in? Um, yes. Uh, so, actually, you hit on what I was going to say right at the end. So, I'll just kind of uh, reemphasize it here. So, when you when you think about what we're doing here, we're taking this big pre-trained model. And then we're going to bolt on um, a smaller model. And if we just bolted on a single layer with the number of neurons equal to the number of classes, then effectively we're just taking the previous layer as is and just kind of projecting it, the dimensionality of its output, which is probably a thousand classes, just down to 10, just so we can make predictions. So we're not really, we're not really using our data that much to refine the predictions of the pre-trained model. So by adding these extra layers, we are adding the ability to refine, refine our model using our data. And so that's kind of what's going on there. And so you've got this big pre-trained model and you're going to add some number of dense layers at the end to both refine the predictions of the pre-trained model based on the data that we have and also then to project down into the space that we need because we have a different number of classes. So you could add, you know, one, two, three or more dense layers at the end. Um, but the more dense layers you add, um, obviously the higher the computational cost will be um, for, for training your model. So there's is kind of like the, the trade-off. And usually when you're using these pre-trained models, you're doing so because your computational budget is going to be relatively low. Um, not large enough to train fully this big model. Cool, so, awesome. That's, that's thanks, David. And also, uh, uh, thanks for that question. That was uh, that was good. That's a great, great question. Okay, uh, we have kind of seen what our model, a simple model, is is like. Let's go and train it. So before we start training, let's choose some of the hyperparameters that we will need. Uh, one of them is batch size. So we we don't train just one example at a time. We do it in chunks, in part because uh, we want to efficiently use our GPU. And the GPU is very well optimized to, to perform training in parallel. So typically you want the batch size to be big enough um, that this chunk of the data set plus the model kind of fills up the GPU. Now, there are also some caveats because as you increase batch size, some other things start to happen with training accuracy and generalization. So we haven't ramped it up too, too high today, but we did ramp it up enough to decrease our training time while still giving us good results. If you want to fully utilize the performance of some of these large GPUs in a, in a cluster setting, then you will want to become familiar with how to work around these caveats and some of the things that you can do to ensure that you still get good accuracy and good generalization out of these large batch sizes. So we provide training for that. Uh, there's a, a distributed best practices for distributed deep learning that's on YouTube and, and coming up for, for COAST put on by KSL. Uh, Dave and I will be there again. That will help you explore how to do that. But there are papers there you know, like training image nets in 10 minutes or something like that, that sort of idea where with enough GPUs and these parameters well chosen and a good optimizer, you can basically get good accuracies. You know, you preserve your accuracies, but you train them very, very fast. Another uh, parameter that we will set is epochs. So typically, when if you train through all your, your data set, which you might do in several batches, after the network has seen the, the complete data set, we would call that an epoch. The idea is that it sees the whole data set, learns from it, and then sees the data set again, learns some more from it. And so we kind of measure the training process and the length in terms of these epochs. The other uh, parameter of interest is the learning rate. So 
the learning rate is going to affect how quickly we can learn. And I will discuss a bit more some of the nuance of it while we're actually doing the learning. Um, and the other potential is that we can decay the learning rate so we get slower. The closer, the closer we get to uh, our final solution, the smaller the learning rate will become. And I'll explain why while we're training. So, but I'm gonna set these values here. So I run that cell. Now we created our model, but we haven't compiled it. So it's not yet ready to run on the GPU. And that's what we're going to do as part of this compile process. We also need to define, for example, how we compute the loss and we need to specify an optimizer for it. So basically we've got our model and if we were to run it, it will produce some outputs. And we have to compare those outputs to what we expected them to be. And how we do that is the loss. And then we have to figure out how do we back propagate that to train the network. And that's going to be the job of the optimizer, uh, which we have chosen here to be RMS prof, which is a, a variant of a gradient descent, but includes momentum. And then we're also going to specify what sort of metrics we want to collect as we're training what we want to collect off. And so we want to kind of get, we want to get um, accuracy out while we're doing the training. And we'll see why in a bit. Okay, so now we have compiled it and this, this uh, model is now ready to run on the GPU. So to do that, we're going to call the fit function. And the fit basically is the, you know, the training function in Keras. And we're gonna pass in the training data, both the inputs and the labels. Uh, we're gonna specify the batch size here the number of epochs we want the training to go for. Uh, we will also pass in the validation data, that's the test data, and that's going to be so that we can collect accuracy while it trains. And we're also going to shuffle the data set as well. Each of the batches will get randomized. Uh, so it's kind of seeing in each batch more new information. Let's think of it that way. So we'll run that. And what should happen is that it begins to run. It says it'll take about 12 seconds each. There's 25 epochs that I've chosen here. So while it's running, let me just explain a little bit about the, the, the batch size and so on. The learning process goes something like this. You put an example in, you feed it forward to the network, and at the end of the network, the network makes its best guess at what it thinks the category is. This gets compared via the categorical cross entropy against the real answer. And depending on how far off the answer is, that loss gets back propagated through the network. So it kind of uh, works a little bit like this. If you get one of the categories uh, really wrong, you, you start going backwards through the network and start asking like, who gave me this answer? right? Who, who contributed most to me thinking that this was, you know, a large value? And those neurons that contributed a lot, you basically decide, okay, I'm not going to believe what you say as much. And so the weighting that you use to evaluate those neurons gets decreased. And if a, a, a neuron, if it didn't contribute to the uh, through the wrong part of the answer, but contributed a little bit to the right part of the answer, you might decide, okay, I'm going to trust you more. So your input means more. And so you increase the weights that come in from that neuron. And so it's a little bit like um, you have to assemble a collection of experts to figure out some problem. And you ask each of them for their opinion on something. And then, so you get the opinion and then you you know, try to, you find out what the answer was. And some of them may not have given good advice. Some may have good, have. And so the ones that give poor advice, you tend to discount and not consider as strongly as those that gave better advice. And that's kind of the, the, the gist of what's happening in this back propagation. What you're trying to do is minimize the loss, which is the, the, the difference between the answer that you provide and the, the true answer. And this loss function is, you can kind of think of it like a landscape where you, like a hillside or a ski hill where you are trying to get to the bottom of, you're trying to get to the chalet. 
you know, imagine if you're on a ski hill, but you're blind, it's a blizzard. How do you get to the ski hill? How do you get to the chalet as quickly as possible? Well, you want to take the steepest route, right? How do you do that? Well, you kind of, you, you know, as you move around a little bit in your local area, you'll see which angle takes you down the steepest. So you might be on the side of a hill and, and as you go along the side of the hill, you don't, you don't descend. But in another direction dimension, you might descend very quickly. And so you will decide, okay, I want to take the route. I want to change my values so that I go down this deeply descending route. And whichever gets, whichever route kind of descends the quickest is the one that gets me to the chalet or the, you know, the, the final answer, right? That's the spot in this function where you get minimum loss, which is kind of where you're the most right, right? But the thing is, is that this landscape is a fair bit more complicated than, you know, a, a three-dimensional ski hill. There could be issues where the landscape has been compressed so that, you, you know, the way, to, the way to the lodge is actually down, you know, one hill, but because of the way that things are normalized or not normalized, uh, it seems like that's a very gentle slope. And so you might end up taking, you know, the steep side down to someplace else. And in the, the real case, there's actually lots and lots of different chalets. You know, there's not just one answer. There's lots of little minimas. Um, so we call these local minimas, but it seems for the most part that most of the minimas are close to being global minimas too. So it doesn't kind of matter which bowl you get into so much you can usually find a good minimum there. You know, normalization is important of the data set so that the different directions that you can go in the data set, uh, that the gradients are relatable to each other. You know, so, you know, you don't want to see some route seem very steep when really there's a long way to go and another route seem um, very shallow, even when it's nearby. And so you kind of want to get the values for the data set to kind of be over the you know, a, a similar range in each dimension. You know, when it comes to picking which direction you go in, so you can imagine if we're just looking at one example in the set every time, each one of these examples is going to tell us a different direction on which to go to the kind of to, to get to the, the minima. But if we take a lot of examples, we, we sample a lot of them, so we make the batch size bigger, suddenly um, the direction that the, the consensus is for the, the, for the sample, the, um, where it's more likely to point in the real direction, right? If, if we were able to take the entire data set and figure out you know, the gradient to get the best result for the entire data set, that would be kind of the best value that uh, the, the best update that we could make. So when you look at just an individual sample or example, there's going to be a lot of noise that will tell you to go in different directions. If the batch size is bigger or big enough, it will start to get approximate, you know, the full epoch of, of the, the complete data set. And the direction that it will give you for the update will tend to be closer to the best one that you could make. So what you can think of, you know, on the ski hill again, you, you might be in a little little bowls or a little lo local minima and you, and you might get information about go left go right go this way go that way so you you, you would have to maybe take smaller st steps or um through walking down or or ski for a shorter distance before you kind of updated and figured out like am i going in the right direction but if your batch size was bigger you could actually take longer steps or, or go further right? Because you're more likely going in the right direction. So one of the issues though, is that as you get closer to this, to the ski hill, so you imagine you're kind of in a deep bowl. And the problem is, is that if you were taking long steps to get down toward the bottom of the hill, and you're getting close to your goal, taking long steps will take you further away, right? So the closer you get to your goal, the smaller your you want your learning rate to be. And that's where the decay comes in because you want to begin with while you're trying to find 
the minimum that you want to get to the bottom of. You want to take larger learning steps, especially if the batch size is, is bigger. But as you start learning and get closer and closer to your goal, you want to uh, reduce that learning rate so that you don't kind of jump out of, of that minimum to go someplace else. Now, that's kind of a very hand wavy sense of what this training was happening. It, it's not a bad insight to think of you know, these neurons as an ensemble of kind of weak experts in some particular facet of the domain. And you will consult them to get a sense of what they think, and then you will adjust your weights to figure out from this ensemble what it is that you want to believe, right? So at a local level inside one network, you can think of it as an ensemble. Each neuron, each you know, sets of neurons are kind of a group of experts that you consult and you weigh them according to how accurate that they have been. This is also is kind of what the dropout is doing. It's actually kind of enforcing this ensemble nature of the experts. And so what dropout does is while you train every batch update, it randomly disables some of the neurons. Um, so they don't contribute to the answer. And this may seem kind of kind of weird because this seems like the network can't be all that it can be, you know, if some of these neurons aren't partic participating. The problem though, when every neuron participates is that you can easily overfit your data because all those neurons, you can basically learn your data set very, very well. But if every time you try to learn something, some of these experts aren't available, you kind of have to learn to make do with some subset of them, some kind of ensemble of them. So one way to think about dropout is it's just kind of hitting some of these neurons over the head and so that you just can't learn as well. Um, and it turns out that this helps with generalization because you can't, it's harder to kind of learn the data set um, by memorization. So basically it makes memorization harder. But another way to think of it, and it has to do with this, it's called the lucky ticket hypothesis, is that a neural network is actually, can be thought of as a lot, an ensemble of many smaller networks. And one of these networks is gonna hit the jackpot and learn what you needed, and the other is not so much. And dropout helps to do that. So here's what the lucky ticket hypothesis, here's why we think that this is the case. What we find after we've trained the network, we find that we can prune out a lot of the, net, the neurons out of the network and the network still performs near the original accuracy and near the original generalization accuracy as well. So this is like, yay, you know, I didn't have to train as big a network. Well, actually you did to get lucky, right? But the nice thing about this is it means that the network that you need to inference effectively on your, your data and domain can, is much smaller than the network that you train. And this is good for taking a network and running it on a small device like a phone. So, you know, you can learn a massive network to learn, let's say, how to translate language and then strip out the neurons that weren't helping and put this smaller network and have it run locally on a phone, on a small, small hardware. You might think, well, you know, why don't we just train with the smaller number of neurons to begin with? And researchers have tried doing this. And if you randomly initialize these neurons, they don't learn near as well as the full network did. However, if you leave their initialization value the same as what they originally had, they do learn. So basically what happened is that some of your neurons got lucky. They just happened to have the right starting weights to learn the important things for your network. So this basically means you need to start out with a large network, lots of neurons. Um, and the rule, a good rule of thumb is that your network should be able to overfit your data. It should be able to memorize it, but then you have to make it so it doesn't do that. Otherwise, it's not going to be useful. And that's where dropout comes in because it prevents you from memorizing, but also because every time it runs, you basically are training a different subset of the network. It's basically like you are using a, an ensemble 
of smaller networks. You're combining this ensemble of smaller networks um, <clears throat> so that they each learn a little bit something different. And this helps ensure that some of them are going to be the lucky ones that kind of get the golden ticket. Okay, a little lengthy, but let's see how, how did we do? Now we've trained our network. Let's see how it's done. Let's start with visualizing it with a history plot. So what this history plot has done, so up here in the training, you can see that the training returns a history. And this is just a list of accuracies and, and so on per, per time step, which is for us going to be the epochs. And there's four different values that we're going to get out from this history. There's the training accuracy and loss. So basically there's accuracy and loss, and then the training and the test. Training and test accuracy are shown in uh, blue and yellow. They're the ones that climb up because you want training accuracy to increase. Loss is in red and green, and you want it to decrease. So what we see here is, let's, let's look at the accuracy first. In the accuracy, we see that it fairly quickly climbs up and then starts to plateau. The training accuracy is greater than the uh, test accuracy. Although, so test accuracy might have plateaued um, or it might still be gaining. So there might be some advantage to training a bit longer, but probably not much. We're, we're getting close to what this particular uh, model and network can learn. The loss is interesting. The green line is for the training loss and it continues to decline. And this means that the network is getting better and better with the training data at, at basically producing the same output values that are in the, the training labels. But the test loss actually seems to be getting worse, maybe even. What this means is that the network is becoming more confident in its answers for the training set, which is data that it has seen, but it's confidence or that this kind of loss is getting worse for the test set for data that it hasn't seen. And maybe just talk about this difference between accuracy and, and loss. You can still get an answer right and be accurate, but not be 100% sure. So imagine, you know, if I'm guessing at a coin flip, I might get the right answer, right? But I'm not really very certain of that. Now, in the case where the data is something that I've seen before, I can learn to become very confident and, and reduce that loss, and basically increase my confidence. But for the unseen case, you know, I still don't. And at some point, very quickly, this plateaus. So we're going to have to try and, and fix that uh, and see what we can do to, to, to improve. But this kind of gives you the general gist of the, the way that uh, accuracy kind of increases logarithmically and starts to plateau, and the way that, that loss tends to decrease, start to pl plateau or even go up. Let's go and just um, evaluate our model on the test case and get the actual numbers out for the final trained model. And we see that basically our test accuracy is only about 0.63%. So not bad, not great. And, and the loss on the test. And again, this is going to be defined. The loss is going to be kind of a dependent on the loss function that we choose. So the absolute number isn't terribly meaningful. It's more meaningful whether it increases or decreases. Let's look how it predicts, the predictions it makes. Just try to understand what it is that this network has learned. We're going to just run these helper cells, which are a plotting functions. So the first one is going to plot out uh, a prediction. It's going to show the images and just show whether or not the network got them right. And in this way, we can kind of maybe see, you know, which sort of images give it trouble, which ones it seemed to get correct. Um, then we're going to look at the classes plot. So we're going to basically look at how certain the network was. So for each prediction that it makes, it's not just picking one category. There is a 10-dimensional array with probabilities, probability weights, which can indicate what its uncertainty is. And when we, what we would normally do is that we would choose the highest value there as the categorization that it had made. 
we're also going to, there's also a way that we can look at, at the image uh, and see which parts of the image help contribute to its conclusion. Um, but we'll look at that when we train our next network, but we'll run this bit of code just to get the uh, plotting functions for it. So let's look at the prediction classes. Okay, so if we look here, we can look at uh, the ones that got right and the ones that got wrong. So I see over here, you know, it thought it was an automobile, but it was a truck. I mean, it does look very, very truck-like to me, actually. But anyway, there's a, a cat, but it thought it was a frog. Maybe two cats. Oh, here's one, a bird. It thought it was an airplane. You can kind of see how that might be. And so on. So you can kind of get a sense of what types of images are, are, are giving it problems. Let's look at its confidence and its, the probability outputs for, um, for its classifications. Here's some interesting examples. Let's, let's look at this one here. So here's one where it got, so it did correctly say that it was a truck, but it also thought it could be a horse with a fair bit of confidence. And uh, an automobile was um, also close behind airplane or deer. So what we can see here is that even though it was maybe only 30% confident that it could have been a truck, uh, it still would have said truck as part of its classification. And that's something to keep in mind when we start to rely on these networks. Just because we get an output from the classifier doesn't mean you know it's correct. So we have to consider, of course, its accuracy rate. But also there's a confidence as well. And we can actually use some of this probabilistic information to glean uh, whether we should even you know, trust the value, the classification that came out of here. So maybe in this case, you know, yes, it was correct, but maybe we'd, we'd decide this is too much uncertainty here. We should really return, you know, not sure uh, as an output. Here's a case where it's fairly confident that's a bird, but deer and frog is also considering. Uh, so here, uh, there is a frog. I thought it could be a deer or a cat. So here, here's an interesting case where it's a deer, but it that was very low. I thought it was a bird first. I suppose you kind of see it's a bird if you ignored the um, antlers, maybe, and so, and so on. Okay, so now let's move on to, to build our own classifier from scratch. So the first thing we're going to do is, like before, we're going to, we're going to create our, our own function for building the model. We're going to use a sequential model, and we're going to use... Uh, much the same layers that we did previously, but we're going to also add in this conv convolution, these 2D convolutions, and the max pooling layer. So before we relied on this pre-trained network, and now we're going to build this ourselves. And we see that the end part here is very similar to what is, in fact, it's the same to what we had previously. That was the, the classifier section, the classifier layers in our network. But we're going to now add our own convolutional and pooling layers. So it basically goes, we do a convolutional layer, we do a, a, a ReLU for the activation, another convolutional layer on top of that. We then pool them together in two by two so to basically decrease the feature size. We're going to add a bit of dropout here, and then we're going to build another layer up on top of that. Again, you know, a three by three convolutions. There's, so we're going to have 32 convolutions at the, at the start, 64 at the second layer, um, and a max pooling size of two by two. So let's run this. We're going to create our model, and we're going to get our summary out, and we can see how the layers are built together. So previously, from the conv convolution layer all the way to the max pooling, that was basically what that, that previous pre-trained network provided, but now we're going to put a smaller convolutional layers there, and we're going to train that ourselves. Uh, and we see that the total number of parameters, we do have to train all of them because nothing is pre-trained, but it's a million and a bit as opposed to 14 million. Okay, we've now created our own model. It's smaller, but untrained. I'm going to use the same hyperparameters uh, for batch size and epoch. Um, I'm going to compile it with the same optimizer, the same loss function, just as before. And now we're going to run it, and it's going to train. And we're coming to the end of this training here.
So um, let's go and plot the history for this. There are some interesting aspects to this. The first is that for the, for the training case, the accuracy and the loss look kind of similar as far as the arc that they take. The, the, the training accuracy, however, is higher. It's uh, you know, just above 80%. We also see that the test accuracy kind of tracks closer to the training accuracy, but it's a little more variable. You know, it looks like maybe at the end, um, the training that we did kind of maybe harmed the, 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 the test accuracy and maybe an, one more epoch would have improved it again. There, there's some variability, it goes up and down a bit. One of the things that you can do is that when you're looking, you're doing your training, you can choose which one of the models to save at, which, at how many epochs along. And there's options that let you specify, you know, just checkpoint the best one so far. So, you know, then it would just, it would ignore the, the poorly trained ones. Um, there's also more variability in the test loss, but it's not as, as far off, but it does also seem like it's plateaued. Let's take a look at the statistics for the entire test set. Test accuracy is 75%. So compared to 63 versus 75%. So that's a pretty significant improvement. So why might this be the case? You know, wasn't this other network, the expert, the, 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 the image feature expert that had been trained on, you know, a massive data set, why didn't it do better than our very simple convolutional network? And so one of the reasons for this is that the data set that the other convolutional network was trained on uh, was quite a bit different. It was more complex. The features it saw were at higher resolutions. We're going to explore a little bit about what our network learned compared to that previous network. Let's look at, at its predictions. So we'll click on this one, this uh, cell here. As we see, most of these are correct, as you would expect for something that can get 75% of the cases great. Um, let's look at the ones that it got wrong. There is one that it said was a dog, which I really don't know what that is. Looks like part of an elephant sitting down or a tree or... So maybe you can kind of see a dog in the very center and next to a tree. What else? There's, there's a cat that's actually a bird. You can kind of see that. A ship, it's hard to make out. There's one that says a ship, that's an airplane. So it's kind of an unusual airplane design. So maybe that's what kind of threw it off. It got a deer as a horse. Sure, because there's a tree, but there's a tree behind its head with the branches coming out. Oh, no, no, hold on. That, 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 is, that is the deer's antlers. It missed those. So it thought it was a horse. Well, there we go. And this one here, there's a deer with no antlers that it thought was a horse. Okay, so it's interesting, not too, too bad. Let's look at, the, at its uncertainty with the probability plots. And here we see greater certainty. There, there's very few cases where it thinks that other possible categories has anything but kind of a sl small amount of uncertainty. In this case here with the automobile is interesting. It thought it was a truck, but it was an automobile. It kind of thought that, but it was more confident in, in truck. So it got that one wrong. But we see that, and that's kind of a, a function of, of what the loss function was doing, that the, the, the test loss wasn't diverging from the training loss. So let's look at what our convolutional kernels were learning. It looks very similar, you know, to, to the one that the previous one was learning, kind of like edge detector sort of thing. Uh, let's look at what is happening. There's the image of a, the image of a cat. And we see that when it applies its feature analysis to it, we get similar looking things, you know, looking for edges, highlighting edges and, and so on. Let's look at how the layers respond. So this is interesting. So remember, this was the one where we basically kind of, we, we trained the input image to try, try and excite the, the, the feature kernel. And what we see is that in the previous one, that first layer seemed to have learned something about, it, li it liked looking for edges, right? At, at particular angles. But here, the first layer doesn't seem to have learned much. And it's not until we get to like the third and fourth layer that, ah, now we're starting to see these similar edge detectors again. But remember that this image set that we're looking at 
very, very simple, very low resolution. So we get a little bit of texture looking for for edges at different angles. That appears to be oh, and here. And here we get in, in the in the last convolution layer, we start to see some textures, some dimpling, you know, things like that. Not as sophisticated as the previous one, but then the domain on which it's learning, not as complex either. Let's look at, uh, we didn't do this one for, for the previous network. You know, so we've done the predictions. It said it's a dog, it's a cat, it's a truck. What we wanted to do is we want to answer the question, what part of the image made you think that? This is a technique called GradCam, which basically uses a gradient. You go from the classifier back to the first kind of convolutional layer. So the convolutional layer lines up with the image. So the, that convolution layer is also, uh, you know, for each one of these convolutions is also going to be um, two-dimensional, right? Just like the image. You will basically, it's like similar to the back propagation of learning, you will ask which one of these convolutions at this very, this top layer influenced, had the greatest influence on my answer. And you kind of do this by, you perturb the answer a bit and, and basically to the derivative, you kind of figure out how much of, of, of a change uh, each one of these convolutional uh, kernels was contributing. And then what you, what, you, what you can do is you can highlight on the image you know, whereabouts this convolutional kernel is, lining up on the image, and that kind of gives you <clears throat> what the original pixels were, what, whatever, so it's gone, so that, that, that area of the image has, of course, gone through many different feature kernels, but what this tells us at the top level is that something in the image there was important, and this is a useful way to kind of know <clears throat> what the, the network has actually learned. So, you know, the example I, I gave you know, with with the, with the, with the tanks and uh, the, the problem learning which ones were camouflaged and when they were or were not there. You know, if if you use this technique to basically find out which areas of the image contributed to the final answer, and you found out that there wasn't a tank there, but maybe the shadow next to a tree, you would go, maybe I don't trust that result so much, right? So that's what this technique can do. And what we can see here is that for cat, it has said it's a cat and it seems to particularly like, so the things that are yellow are, are what we're looking for. Uh, I can't really see the cat there, so I'm gonna ignore that one. So the bird, it seems to, this is an ostrich, it seems to really like its legs and maybe its legs. That, so, I mean, ostriches, that's kind of their thing, very meaty legs that can run very fast. Um, there's an, another bird. Interesting, this one seems to be looking at the uh, background to this bird. And there's also certain aspects of it that make it think it might be like a ship or a frog. The frog was, seems to uh, be the strongest indicator in the image for our network is the, this back leg. And we see that from mostly it's the body of the dog in this case, but also the head and the back haunches. So that gives us a sense of trying to explain why did the network choose this? Gradicam is a technique that we can, we can use. So remember I talked a little bit about ensembles and the value of, you can think of neural networks as an ensemble of neurons and the neurons are all giving you kind of different input and you decide by how, by your weights, how much you value their contributions. Well, we have two networks, so why not combine them together into a bigger network and use the contributions for both. I mean, they've each learned something. Uh, one did better than the other. Certainly that previous training must have been useful. Let's see what, what happens. So we're going to, again, create our, a model. This one, by the way, is a little bit different. We're, we're gonna, we're, so we're gonna use the a functional interface for Keras. So previously we used the sequential one when the layers were built one after the other. But in this network, we want to take one input, split it into the two models, the two other networks, and then bring the result back again for a final top level classifier. And so we're going to use this functional approach. And the difference is, is that instead of adding these layers, we create the layers. So this is what this top part is creating these two different networks. 
they're going to be provided, passed into this function. And then what we do is we create the layers as before. So here's a, a concatenate layer. This one's new. And this takes two inputs and creates kind of a, a single output, which is the two, two arrays concatenated together. And then we pass in these values. So we can see that there's one input, right? But two networks. And each one of these networks takes the same input. That's the inputs right there. And then this concatenate is a single layer, which we create. But then we're going to pass in its two inputs, the C1 and C2, right? Previous layers. And so this is how we can pass in multiple inputs into a, a layer. And so instead of having sequential, we can now have like tree-shaped networks. We're going to go into the, a, a dense layer. And again, in this functional approach, we have to explicitly pass the inputs and the outputs along, uh, which is why each of these have variable names. And we get to the very end, we get the outputs, and we're going to create the model. To create the model, we pass in the inputs and we give it the outputs, and it knows how they're connected because we have already connected them as part of the building process. So let's run that. This is the to create the function, define the function that will create this classifier for us. We're going to make a new version. We're going to, we're going to see that it now has lots of parameters, but only a fraction of them are trainable. And we're going to, so actually, what, ah, that's the interesting thing. What I did is for both the networks that I passed in, I had previously trained them. So I will not be training them this time, right? Similar to what we did at the very beginning. But now I can do that for my own network that I just created, the, the, the previous sequential one. Let's look what the, the plot of this looks like. So here we see that there's actually a split. It's no longer sequential. We split the input layer up. It went into two sequential networks and then back out to be concatenated and then finally, we had our uh, classifier at top. Let's go and compile that and run that. Now, I'm only going to train over five epochs because both those other networks are fairly expert at what they do. Um, I just need a little bit of practice learning which, ones of, which one of them to trust when, right? It takes a little longer to train uh, each, each one. It, it, there's a fairly big network behind it but I don't have to train for as long. Someone asked, what, what's the benefit of using two networks? Well, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, the saying two heads are better than one, even if one's a cabbage head, right? That's, so both these networks know something. Uh, one is trained specifically on the small domain. One has other information. And so we, we will see if it has any benefit. So let's go take, let's plot the history. So basically after the first time step, there was really not much more to learn. After the first time step, we, the classifier at top can already figure out which one of these other networks to trust when, right? Let's see if that changed the overall uh, test accuracy. 0.788, what did we have previously? 0.748. So we, we have gone up about three or four points in, in test accuracy by combining these two networks together. And so that kind of explains what the benefit of the two networks is, is that uh, we could utilize the information that was in the previous network, learn some new information about our new domain. So, so basically one of the networks has seen a very small domain and the other has seen a very big domain and knows a lot about different stuff about images, but there's each information that neither of them has seen. And so combine them together kind of lets us combine the information and the knowledge from both. Okay, so where did it get wrong? There's a, a ship and an airplane. So you can kind of kind of see, you know, the pictures of the, of the airplane at the airport with the, with the nose and the cockpit and view, um, you can kind of see that there maybe. Still makes, makes mistakes, but um, yeah, a, a, an increase in, in, in performance nonetheless. So we could also kind of train the network from scratch there's no real benefit from doing that. Let's go to, to the last section here, which is skip connections. So now that we've learned how to use this functional API, or we've seen how to use the functional API, we now have access to creating more complex networks that are not just sequential. One of the issues with the sequential 
a network that has a sequence of uh, feature detectors of uh, convolutional kernels, information from the lower layer has to be passed up. And if that information is forgotten, then you can't use that information at the higher level to make decisions on. So you only have the information that got preserved, got propagated through the network. So what skip connections let us do is to create a network where, yes, we are learning new features, but we can also get access to the previous information. And so when we finally come to the classifier and try to figure out what class it is, we don't just have the top level features, we have the middle layer features, and we have the lower level features as well. So for example, if we were doing a face detector, you know, we might just have access to the feature detector for faces, and we'd have to trust it. You know, if it said there was a face there, we have to say, okay, well, there must be a face there. Um, but if we had skip connections, we could also figure out if there were eyes and nose and mouth there as well, or some information about there had to be an edge, you know, around, around the boundary of the face, right? So the, um, or a certain texture for the hair, and we could combine that um, into our decision-making process. So this lets the, the, um, the classifier gives it access to more information. So to do this, let's, let's run this uh, cell. <clears throat> My model creation code gets a little bit more complicated because I'm going to work with this original model and I'm going to pull it apart so I can add in these other skip connections because there was no skip connections in the original one. And now what I do is I'm going to basically pull it apart and then compose them these you know, chunks of layers back together again, but I'm gonna compose them in a way where they combine the input from the previous you know, chunk of layers, combine it together, we've seen how concatenate works, and then um, sends that down to the next layer. So we can kind of see here that I'm looping over all the, all the layers, um, I'm setting them to be not trainable because I don't want to update that training. I'm going to add them back together, add them into my skip list, and then I'm going to con concatenate those back together. For time-wise, I'm going to skip more detailed explanation, um, but you can see if you can follow along with the code, or we can talk about it afterwards when we're doing the um, uh, when there's a free time for the, for the last um, exercise. I'm going to create this. I'm going to get my summary. So th this here is my uh, the summary of my layers. I see the it's, I see the input ones. I see how I've made like five different sequential layers, which were the uh, previous you know convolutional max pooling layers that we had previously. I'm flattening them together, bringing them together in a dense layer, and then add an activation to them, doing dropout and making them, concatenating them all together to make them available for the final classifier. And the, the graph of this gets a fair bit more complicated. We see the inputs, it goes into that first layer, which then the outputs from it go to the next layer. So, so if, we, if we follow along the left-hand side of this tree, we kind of get that original network. But if we go down the right-hand side, we see how this data is being flattened activated a bit of dropout just to arrive. We're basically just passing it forward into the classifier. Again, if I follow this next sequential layer, we see the flattening, the dropout, the concatenation. <clears throat> That's just a way to bring this earlier information and skip it ahead in the network to the final layer. So let's go and train that. Let's see how we're doing so far. So. <clears throat> As part of this training, it is printing out epoch by epoch, um, some information on the loss, the accuracy, um, <clears throat> the validated loss and the validated accuracy. So the validated one is the one that does, that, that's uh, done on the test set that we passed in. We're already getting a little bit better actually than the performance <clears throat> on our simple model trained purely on the CIFAR 10 data set. We'll, we'll find out what the, what the end results are, are going to be. But it seems that if we were able to 
past the lower level information that the VGG16 network knew about up to the classifier, um, the classifier could do a substantially better job. We're already you know, 10 points better than, than, than previous. Uh, we can also try doing using this approach with our own kind of hand rolled network, but uh, I not it'd be interesting to do, but I don't think it would work as well. In part because when we looked at what the convolution kernels at that first layer or two had learned, they hadn't learned a whole bunch, right? So it might not help to to pass the information along. I'll also point out that. It, it may help to have this tab open. You can shut down this notebook so that you only have one notebook running if that turns out to be an issue. It might be useful just to have it around so that you could um, review the, the model generation code here um, and just help you with the, the, next, the next notebook. So what we can do maybe while we're, we're waiting is to head over to Kaggle and I'm going to I'm going to put this in the chat. This is a link to the challenge that we will try um, next. Make sure you open that in a new tab uh, so that you don't lose the, uh, the, the work that you have going on right now in Google Colab. So if you don't already have an account there, you can sign in and just create an account. It's free. So that, that will get us a head, give us a head start for, for the next section. Okay, home stretch, two more epochs left to go. And we see our accuracy again fluctuating a little bit. So unfortunately, I need this to complete so I can get the history out to, to, to make the graph. So if I stop this now, my model would be partially trained, but I wouldn't get the accuracy out, out of it. Okay, voila, and I plot the history. And here we see actually quite nice results. You know, we, we, still, we still are improving, but we very quickly began to approximate our top accuracy values. The test and the training accuracy remain close to each other. The test and the training loss also remain close to each other. Although it looks like that the test is still kind of plateauing, but at least they're, they're close together. So that means that generalizability, the generalization of the network is pretty good. Let's evaluate the scores for the test set and this is 75% accuracy for the test sets. That's not, not bad at, at all. So, and that was basically using just the original network, but with skip connections. Okay, cool, cool. I'll lure everyone again. We'll get ready for, for the next section, which is basically where you get a chance to put some of what you've seen today to use. So I hope that you have found uh, you know, this session very interesting and, and worthwhile. And I hope that you'll, you'll get lots out of it and that you will have a great start applying these deep learning frameworks to your own uh, problems and, uh, and, and data. What I'm going to do is open up the exercise in Colab again. Now, one of the things that I did in my previous Colab is I had gone to runtime, uh, manage sessions, and, and I had terminated my, um, terminated my, my session. Um, so I only had one available. But it stays up, and I can still you know, copy and paste out of it. Um, so let me go and open up the exercise. That's the second one. I'm going to open that up in Colab as well. And so the link to that is below in the, in the chat. I'm going to go through the first part fairly quickly. Uh, we do have to kind of repeat some of these things again. So there's the setup Colab for GPU. So I'm going to change the runtime type to use a GPU and save. And now I'm going to run this cell. Kate, I want to run anyway, same as last time. I'm going to download the data, get these caching functions uh, defined. This one is um, similar to the last one, except instead of the CIFAR 10, it's now going to be the MNIST data set. I'm again going to, to set up my environment with the libraries for data science and for deep learning that we were using previously. I'm going to make matplotlib work inline, and I'm going to verify my environment again. And voila, so it's with CUDA, I've got a GPU device and uh, running TensorFlow and in Colab. So if you're having issues, just let us know in the chat. I'll kind of go ahead and, ah, okay. So here we go, our next section, uh, we have to shift expand to be able to see everything. And 
let's go and cache our data set, uh, make sure that it's, it's there. Voila, perfect. Okay, so we've got our, our data set. We're now gonna create some helper functions for it. We don't need text labels because it's a digit data set, so the digits do just fine. I'm gonna cache the models again, just in case we wanted to use that VGG16. I'm going to load the data into memory as we did before. And this, this is the, the backup load and it says it's loaded, so we're good. Now we're gonna to start to explore this data and print out some information about it, like its shape and its type, a little bit of small amount of statistical information. So we see that it is a numpy array as before. It's also unsigned into eight byte for the, for the X and the Y values. The shape is a little bit different. This is interesting because there are more examples in this data set, but the examples are smaller. They're 28 by 28. The other one was 32 by 32 by three. This is technically 28 by 28 by one, but it doesn't show the, the one there. That's kind of, it doesn't need to specify that dimension. So it doesn't. And so 60,000 training samples, um, 10,000 testing ones. The min and max values for the, for the intensity values of the image are zero and 255 as before, but the, the, the mean is of course different. There's, there's more black in these images, you will see. And the, the, the categories are also show up zero to nine. So here are some helper functions for, for plotting the, the, the data set. Let's go in and plot it now. So this is what it looks like. You can see there's a, a variety of digits with they're written. There's a three that could almost be an eight if, if it were completely closed. There's a nine that could almost be a one. There's a wide variety there. Let's just go and look at this the histogram again, similar as before. We're going to plot the training and then the um, test set. Now, what's interesting about this one is that the, the Y histogram, the histogram of the Y values, they're not exactly the same. The previous data set, there was exactly the same, like 10,000 for each um, class. This one, it's a little varied, but they're still very close to each other. So the number of them, you know, it's fairly well balanced. And, and similarly with, with the test set as well, the, the balance between them seems to be uh, fairly similar. The histogram is a little strange, but kind of makes sense because most of the values here are black, as you see from the data set up here. The, most, of the, most of the digit is black background. And then a little bit of it is going to be, you know, the various shades of, of light, white and light gray um, up at the very top end. Again, the histogram for the test and the training set are very similar. So that's, that's good. This histogram plot of the per category, not quite as useful because they, they all look alike basically, but so, so nothing really jumps out as really way off. So, but, which is good. Okay, let's go and look at our principal component analysis and our TISNI from previously. So remember that these are going to help extract lower dimension representations of the image space, but they're going to do it uh, by keeping the most important ones. And we're going to see if we can kind of separate, how much we can separate out the data into these lower dimensional spaces. So I'm going to basically just uh, running this now. Okay, so the components that it breaks down into are kind of interesting. You can start to see parts of numbers there. You know, the old clocks that have, you know, they have digits are represented with seven different little bars that can either turn, turn white or black. You know, so you can kind of build whatever digit you want, whether whether it's something that's turned, a little bar is turned on or off. You can kind of see that for zero or eights or things like that, <clears throat> this white circle shape could be very useful. Uh, we see threes showing up and nines. And then we have, for the various variations that people have in their writing style, we have other less important uh, basis vectors of, of, for, for, this, for this image space. A uh, seven segment display, someone says. Yes, Th uh, thank you very much. Let's do a scatter plot to see if we can get the, if the, if the categories jump out and this the, we're just defining the 2D and the 3D. Ah, okay. The PCA plot, there's still overlap between them in the image space, but we, you know, we can certainly see that the orange, which is the one digit, seems to kind of be distinct from the others, and red, which is three. So we, we start to see them 
a bit more separable than the previous data set, but not quite to the same extent. Let's just do that 3D version. This would be a bit better if we could rotate it. But still, you know, we see some separation, but it's not completely clean. We can't just kind of cut a plane in this space and, and say, you know, this digit's on one side and this other digit's on the other side. Let's look at Disney. We're going to create our embeddings, sample categories. Now we're going to fit Tisney. So still a slower operation, um, but I think it's a little bit faster than it was for the other image. The other images were you know, at least three times bigger. So we're only going to learn over 6,000 of the images, not 60,000. Okay, so that's done. And let's go and show our scatter plot. Voila. Okay, so this is kind of the, the, the plot I would have liked to have shown you right from the beginning. So this kind of tells us though, is that our data set, the image space is actually fairly close to being an image space that we, to, to being a space that we could almost directly pull the classes off of. So yeah, so we get nice separation between the different classes. The ones that are nearby, let's, let's take a peek at this. So there's nine, which is the kind of turquoise teal and the purple, which is four, kind of. I mean, if you close the top of a four, you can get a nine, right? It's some fours are written with, with the top closed. Let's see what else kind of overlaps a little bit. There's the red, which is the three, and the brown, which is the five. Well, yes, so the, the five is like a three where the top's maybe been flipped around a little bit. Interesting. So this would probably be more amenable to some other simpler approaches for classifying the, the data set, but we're going to use uh, deep learning anyway. Let's go get our data and do the conversions on it. Same as before, we're, go we're going to uh, change the category indexes into one hot vectors uh, with 10 classes. We now have, uh, so I've also re reshaped them to have three dimensions. So uh, to have an X and a Y and a channel and the plotting library is like this. And this means that we can kind of use the similar logic that we had done previously. I'm also going to normalize those images so that they lie in the zero to one range and use floats, similar to before. I'm also going to evaluate these cells just so that we have our plotting functions available to us so that we can go and you know, output the results and, and do some of the things that we saw in the previous notebook. Now what we'd like you to do is to create your own CNN classifier model. And we've created a cell here for you where there's a, a function that you will need to complete to, to create, you know, if you want a simple sequential model, uh, we'll also set up these kind of default uh, parameters for you. And we've also created a function where you will create your compiled code. So basically the compiled function calls create my model, which is that logic from above to create the model. And then what you have to do is you have to do that compile step and provide the uh, optimizer for it. And that will return a ready to fit uh, model. And then what's gonna happen here is that we're going to get our model and then fit it. So this, so this is the part that you, you can fit in Okay, uh, 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 thank you very much for the kind comments about the uh, training. This is the KBL uh, channel. Lots of resources available. For those interested in visualization and data science, um, lots of data science stuff there. David has produced an, an amazing amount of uh, resources. A question about the activation plot. So there are links there. There's the two relevant sections uh, for this are this generate activation pattern which does, does the heavy lifting and does the work. The activation plot basically just it gets a bunch of images and, and creates the plots. And I'll, I'll explain what that does, but maybe the first thing I'll do is I'll explain the generate activation pattern. And what this is doing, so for each uh, classification label, it's figuring out which part of the image, providing kind of the most support for that. The relevant paper is above, that's the uh, GradCam visual explanations. And there's two example posts that show example code and some explanation as well for what is the general activation pattern uh, function below. 
Um, there's also some, if you search for that, you might find some you know, YouTube videos of people explaining it. Basically, what you, what you are going to need is you're going to need so the, the last layer of, of the, the convolutions and then the classification layer. Let me see where we get this. Okay, so where do we get these two layers from? Well, one is that we one gets passed in. This is the con, convolution layer output. And that's kind of like that's, that's kind of middle top of, of the network. And the other is the final output of the network where the classification happens. And we can get that from the model class. So remember these, you know, sequential and model are uh, sequential is a type of model. Model is the very general um, Keras model. Uh, class, it has a, a member called output, which is the basically the final layer of that network. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create a new model that is basically is the old model, but we have some key inspection points into it. So <clears throat> this model is going to take the, to the model that we pass in this new model, which we call the activation model. It takes the same inputs as our original model but it produces two outputs. And the two outputs are the convolutional layer output and also the model output, that previous model. So if we were to run, so the, and remember this model is, is already trained and it's all set to go. <clears throat> so our new model, which uses the existing layers from the previous model that we've passed in, it's trained also, and we can run an image through it, for example. And the outputs that we will get are basically the output for that convolutional layer and the output for the model itself. And this means we have the convolutional output, which is um, not yet flattened. It is basically, it's a 2D array. Now, it may be smaller than the image, right? Because remember that we've gone through the pooling layers and kind of shrunk them down bit by bit. But it does have a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence with that original image. And what is there at that convolutional layer output, that array, it is 2D, but it's also deep as well, because the depth is the convolutional kernels. You remember those are kind of feature detectors? So each one of these is detecting something different about the image, right? So this is going to be the, an output, and then also the actual model output, which is the, which is the classification probability of a particular class, right? What we kind of want to know is now that we have these two, we have the output and we have kind of the interesting bit about which of these features um, is, is, so these features are going to drive this output. And we want to kind of back propagate in a way and say, who was responsible for making this value what it is? And so uh, we, we use the derivative for that. So to get access to the derivative, um, we're going to, to kind of watch it, we're going to use uh, what's called gradient tape in TensorFlow and, and in, in Keras. So, so this is similar to the autograd functionality in PyTorch. So the cool thing is that if, if you build up a function piecewise and that function is, each of those functions is simple, it's easy to get the derivative for each of those functions that, that you've composed together. And using you know, rules of calculus and chain rules and things like that, you can basically, at the same time you build your formula, your, your function that goes forward, you can also build a function that will give you the gradient at a particular point. And so this is kind of a way to automate the process of calculating the derivatives. Within the context of this gradient tape, um, we are basically going to pass in the image um, that we wanted, where, and the image gets passed into us, we're going to pass in this image as input to this activation model, which is the model that we just kind of made. But it's, it basically is the old model, but just kind of rewrapped so that it outputs um, these two things that we're interested in. And as we can see here, we, it outputs the convolutional output, but also the prediction. So what we're also passing in is which category we're interested in finding out about. So what we were basically doing is it's in this prediction. Um, so it's an array. And you know, if you want to explore this yourself, you can put print statements in to print out 
like you know prediction shape or, or type of prediction its shape is going to basically be uh, whatever the batch size was and that second dimension is basically part of our one hot encoding and so if we want like category two then we will just take you know element two out of there and that's going to give us the category output from, from for that then what we're going to ask is for the gradient for our category output we want to know the gradient at the convolution output which will tell you how each of these kernels is contributing to category output right but that's not the whole story because you know a particular kernel could go yes i really believe that this feature is here like, absolutely 100 percent and then the weight from that feature to the classifier is like no i don't really believe this 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 uh classifier this this um i don't really believe this feature that much so that feature hasn't really contributed even though it was very positive it didn't it didn't contribute and so what you're going to want to do is basically so where does this happen later on yes so we're going to multiply these okay so before we get to the multiply we're going to take the mean of all these gradients okay because we have we kind of have a stack of these convolutions we're going to kind of take the average of them all together because that's at that particular layer and then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply that average the pooled gradients by the convolutional output so basically it's a function of how much did it contribute and how strong was its signal and, and and how much did we how much weight did we give to it this is going to be reduced into a new mean we're going to find the maximum which is so um, we're going to find out the maximum of that. So that's basically kind of collapsing these different values down. We've already collapsed it down. Now we basically, we were going to clip off the zero one, so the negative one. So we could have things that are negatively contributing. So it's like, um, you know, I see a tail there and but I'm looking, I think it's a truck. Therefore, um, you know, definitely don't think it's a truck because I see a tail. Um, so we're going to get rid of those because those aren't contributing positively toward my belief in something. We, we clip those off and then we're going to normalize. And that's what that last step is. And that returns the heat map. And you do that for each category and that gives you the heat map. And then this part here is basically going through and plotting those out. So what we see here is, so this, so this is going to do it for, for one particular um, image, which we kind of randomly get. Um, so we get yeah, we call a generate activation panel with our particular image for our particular class that we're interested in, and we add stack it onto the the plot. Okay, let's go and get back to our example here. I'm going to go and copy the code. The code I'm going to copy is this one here. It's the second model that we made. Perfect. I'm going to paste that into my. And the other one is going to be the, so this, I think we, I already, yes. <clears throat> so I actually already brought this in. I already brought in our RMS prop that we had used previously. And I have to change the name, mm -hmm. model. And now I can run this cell, run. And now let me try and train my model. So it looks the same as before, except the inputs are shaped a little bit differently. 28 by 28. I'm now going to fit it. So because this is a smaller data set, I'm only going to fit 12 epochs. Okay, we're coming to the home stretch here. We can see by the, the, the uh, validation accuracy, phenomenally good. And it kind of makes sense because this was such an easy data set to pull apart, Tisney was already able to do quite a good job already and, and separate it out into different categories. Let me just look at the, the history plot for that. Almost immediately, it hit top accuracy. The training loss and the test loss also seem to align very, very closely and, and track each other. So 0.993 test accuracy. And with results like that, we would expect the prediction uh, and the actual results to match up pretty closely. So, yeah. The other thing to notice is that the probabilities are almost all 100%. So the very high certainty. So it's not just high accuracy, but also on this data set, 
high certainty as well. Okay, that takes care of the try it yourself part. Let's go and start the competition. The first thing you need to do is to register for an account. So hopefully this was already done. So, um, and, the, and the link was, was there. I didn't have to put it in the chat. Okay, does everyone have their account and everyone logged in to their profile page? Okay, so what's gonna happen is that there is a, so the, the file dollars will be called kaggle.json. And in it will be a, a JSON format, which is JavaScript object format. And you'll see you know, two, two keys and a value. And they'll, um, it'll be, one is called username, which is your username for Kaggle. And the other will be key. So you'll, you'll need to be able to copy these out and paste this into your, into your Kaggle account. So let's go and do that. Um, I, I need to shift click to expand that. Okay, so we've registered, um, went to the account tab, got a new API. We generated a Kaggle file with username and key values. And now we're gonna to have to fill out this field. So in this field where it says your username, you're gonna put your username. So not mine, just, just yours. And you'll also want to put your API key in. This is a bit more complicated, so you're going to want to you know, copy and paste it in, and it'll be a bunch of numbers. Um, you can go on yours and enter this number in between the strings. And then what's going to happen is that this cell is going to call a bash. Um, it's going to call a Kaggle command that's provided by Colab. And it's basically it's an interface to Kaggle that lets you interact with the competitions and, and the data sets uh, from the command line as opposed to a, a web browser. So when you enter this command key in try running the cell, I ran that previous cell from, from Kaggle. Um, and uh, what I got was a little bit of a warning about an older version of the client, but that's, that's Google's business, not mine. I didn't install that. It's then going to download one of these data sets, um, which is going to be a zip file. So there's a zipped uh, CSV, so that's comma separated values, which we're going to have to have to read in. And then I ran the cell afterwards to unarchive these files so that I can read them in directly into my notebook. Do, do you, but, but it'll be good to, it's good for you to make sure that this, um, um, that getting this data sets from Kaggle, Kaggle works because uh, you'll want to be able to use these Kaggle commands with the API key to interact with your account so that you can submit your competition. I'm going to skip over this alternative one. So we don't need the alternative. So now we need to submit to, to Kaggle. And we need to train on their data set. And there's some kind of interesting caveats with their data set because they don't provide for the test set, they don't provide labels. So we don't actually know what our testing accuracy is because that's what they're gonna tell us when we submit it. First of all, let's go and have a look at the CSV file that they provided. I'm going to use a bash command head just to look at the first two lines. So this is a very kind of inefficient way to store these files, but um, it works. And we see that the CSV, the first line is, is the header, which contains the column names. So the first column is the label, which will be, you know, one, two, three, four, five, up to nine. And then we have these pixel values, which is a very kind of strange way to do it. So how many, there's about 700 and some, yeah, almost 700 and some, so that, that's a pixel. We remembered that um, MNIST was 28 by 28. So um, we times that together and what's that, 768 or something like that. So it's basically taken what was a two dimensional image and kind of put it into a one dimensional kind of flattened array. Let's look at the test case. Interesting, very similar, but no label. And we're gonna have to work around that later on. How do we go and read a CSV file. And so we're, we're gonna use a Python library for this called PANDAS, which is kind of a de facto data processing exploration library for data scientists. And it uh, interface with NumPy, which is, uh, which is great. Here we've read it in, and here we see kind of a, um, when we read it in, we get kind of a, a nice summary of what the data looks like, again, the test case doesn't have uh, the labels, uh, 784 
columns. So now let's load it in. And at the end, you basically see uh, our read CSV similar to above, but this time we're going to convert it into particular types of data type, an uh, unsigned int, and we're going to convert it to, to NumPy so that we get NumPy arrays out of this. So we get the features. Uh, yes, yeah, so the features are the image itself, and we get the row range, the columns, sorry, from 1 to 785. Whereas for the label range, we only use column zero. So that's why there's two of these loads here. One is to get the image set, the image features, and the other is to get the labels and put them in different arrays. So let's go in and run that. Let's go in and just explore this data again, as we have done before, to see that it is a NumPy array. And similar to before, unsigned int, the shape's a little bit different. There's fewer examples here. They're probably withholding some of them for testing. They also have, it's flattened instead of, so we're, we're gonna have to reshape it. We'll look, at, look at some stats for it. So similar to what we saw before with the range of values for the features and the labels. We see again that it's the MNIST data set. One of the things I had done previously is I had modified the image plotting function above to handle images of different shape and kind of uh, reshape them automatically. We see that although there's fewer uh, um, examples, they have the same sort of distribution both in um, the, the classes and also in the values for the images themselves. Let's go and convert these this data similar to as before. We want to convert it into a normalized data set using floats. And we also want to take the labels and put them to this, you know, the one hot category. We're also going to reshape them from this flat 784 array into a 28 by 28 by one 3D you know, XY channel input that, that our network expects. Um, here we're going to normalize our data and just kind of look at the values and say, yes, they've changed, we've reshaped it, and so on. So let's go in, so let, uh, let, let's look at our previously trained classifier and see how it does with, with this data. One of the reasons for us to kind of reshape the MNIST data provided by Kaggle is, is so that we could use our previous model and try it on this data set. So we see we still get you know, great accuracy on the training set. And again, similar outputs before for the predictions. Okay, now let's go and it wants us to modify our, our hyperparameters. I'm going to use, let me just use, use five just to go faster. Uh, but you can use what, what you would like, whatever makes your model work best. We're basically going to call this function, create my compiled model code with the learning rate and the decay that we specified here. And we're going to train it for the number of epochs. That was the nice thing about putting our models, uh, our model generation inside a function and we can keep calling it and get different copies of these uh, models with different parameters that we've passed in. So that's gonna come in handy now. And how do we do? Converge pretty quickly. Okay, so now when I go to evaluate it, I don't have a test set to evaluate it on. I just have the, the training set, which it does very, very good at, to be expected. I'm gonna plot out the, the training data here. You can look for any errors. Also the, the, the classes again, just for consistency. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna generate predictions on the test features. Now, so I'm gonna take the first model. So this is a, kind of a neat little trick actually, because I now have two networks. One of them was trained on the larger data set, and it, it also, we have also validated it. So we know how it does on, on a held out set as well. So we know how well it generalized. So we're going to make, have it make some predictions on it, on the test feature that Kaggle provided. And then we're going to do the same thing with, with um, the, the, this Kaggle model that we just made, tested with just the, the, the Kaggle data. What we're then going to do is show them side by side and just see, so here's the image. Uh, so it found some differences. So here's a case where on this particular image, which was 17,553, our model predicts four, uh, but Kaggle, the one that we trained us in the Kaggle data set predicts two. 
to be fair, the Kaggle model was trained with fewer epochs and against a smaller data set as well. So it does not know as much. And we can see some other cases. So, uh, so, but the interesting case here is that here, the Kaggle model, I think did better. So our previous model predicted a four, but um, Kaggle predicts that the new model predicts a nine, which I think that would be a nine and so on. So this kind of lets us get a sense of how these models compare. And now what we need to do is we need to export the, the models into a submission CVS file. What this file is, it contains an image ID of, from the test set, and then we're going to put into it what our label is, right? This is the, the prediction. And we're gonna send that off to Kaggle for the competition to, um, to, to test. So this next cell is going to do that for us. It's going to create a results Kaggle submission. It's going to make the directory, timestamp it, create that file, and then it's going to take the, the data frame and the predictions that, that we previously made, right? And then it's going to put that into CVS, in, into this file, and then we're just going to read it back just to see what it looks like. Okay, so now when we look at this file, we see the image IDs here in the test case, but we also see what our labels were that we had predicted. So th this file looks like it's going to be correct. And now comes the part where we're going to submit this to, to Kaggle. So again, we come across one of these Kaggle cells. So you will need to put your information in and your API key. You will need to copy this information out of your Kaggle.json file that you received. Or you can copy it from above when you did it previously. And I'm going to run that cell. It said successfully submitted. So now if I go over to the, to the leaderboard and I'm going to look for, so I'm going to go over to my, well, actually my submissions should be here. So I did just submit one. A chest now, and if I go, there's the, the and um, so my public score is 0.98. So this one wasn't as trained for as long as the previous ones that I did. So it's down. Um, so we're, we're gonna let's go in and, and find it here. So 0.9847, ah, 0.9847. So at 1743rd place, that's submitted now. I'm, part of the competition. And if you want, you can then see if you can kind of climb up the rank a bit and, and do better. That gives you a sense of, of what that process is like. You can look and find other competitions. You know, you might find interesting data sets. Let's just do a search for biology enzyme. Okay. So there's an InstaDeep enzyme classification challenge that has an example data set to explore. It's still ongoing. There's there's also one for the COVID-19 viral protein identification. So there's a competition for that, possibly a data set. And, and you might find that there are other, the different approaches that people took. So it's a community of uh, data scientists challenging each, each, each other to, to get better. So uh, someone asked if we increase the EPUC number, we could get, get better score. Um, you could, you know, my, my previous submissions were uh, 12 epochs instead of uh, five, and they were they were slightly better. So um, yes, you could probably uh, uh, do better. There's also other there's other approaches like you know image augmentation. You can try like you know doing some some slight modifications to the image, like um, skewing it a little bit or uh, a small rotation or something like that. You know, in doing this, you you can actually give the the model more data to learn from and because the, the amount of skew and rotation and squishing of the image might be is slight, you still get within the realm of uh, potentially valid, you know, real numbers, right? Um, so that might be another thing that, that you can do is the data augmentation. So let me go. So hopefully you have, have your results submitted. Does anyone need help with getting their results submitted? So, uh, before I turn it off, I'll just say thanks everyone for attending and um, I wish you the best luck in the, your future deep learning projects. I hope this has helped and I'll stay around as long as um, someone says that they need help.